exactly. <laughs> Substitute <laughs> school committee member. I know. <laughs> All right, I think that we are ready whenever you are. There you go. Good? Okay. Hello, and welcome to the November 16th regular meeting of the Hopkinton School Committee. I will ask you to stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, we have a um, we have a technical issue, but uh, we have a packed agenda tonight. So let me quickly read through the agenda, and then we will get right down to business. We'll start with recognitions, followed by our first opportunity for public comment. We'll have reports to the school committee by the student council. We'll have a NESDEC refresh report by Dr. Kennedy. Um, budget reports, including the central office, technology, buildings and grounds, special education, athletics, um, <coughs> and then K-12 arts and music. Following that, we will have liaison reports and the school committee chair report, as well as the super, um, a monthly financial report by Ms. Rothermick and the superintendent's report. Under new business, we have a budget transfer to consider and um, several field trip requests. Um, and, we and then we have a new proposal for a unified track and field program. Following that, we'll have our second opportunity for public comment. We have no old business tonight. And um, followed by items by consensus. At the end of our regular session, we will have executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation. So, without further ado, I would like to invite up Bridget Belger and Young Wang to give our student council report. <coughs> Hello. Hello. And you guys know the drill. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Hi. <coughs> All right, so um, the first thing that we have going on is that Susical um, was tonight. It was their open dress rehearsal. They also have shows tomorrow night, Saturday night, and Sunday afternoon. Tomorrow is the powder puff between um, the junior and senior class at 7. Um, Saturday we have football at 2. And this is a really crucial game for us, so rooting for the Hillers. If we win, we get to play at Gillette after Thanksgiving, so that would be really awesome for us. We also have volleyball at 5.30 tomorrow, and if they win, they will be defending state champions. So, wow. Good time to be a Hiller. <laughs> yep. and, um, <coughs> tomorrow is a Hiller day for us, so we got in school an hour late, which is always nice. Um, Student Council has been up to a lot of drives lately, so we had a shoe drive this past week, and we also have a can drive going on for the Thanksgiving time. Um, we have the Thanksgiving football game between Ashland, and so it should be pretty fun. And uh, we have the Top of the Hill Award next Tuesday. And on that day, I believe, we also have Free Free Handball, and it's a homework-free Thanksgiving weekend, so oh, good. always nice. Yeah. looking forward to it a lot. Yeah. So is Turkey Day at home or away? It is at home, I believe. Awesome. <laughs> Predictions on Powder Puff? Go seniors. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we'll see. I'm rooting for the juniors. Oh. We'll see, we'll see. Okay. Awesome. Is, um, any questions? All right. Well, thank That's you guys great. so That's much, great. as always, thank for you. coming. Thank you for you're, you're welcome to stay, but if you'd rather do homework, we understand. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Happy Thanksgiving. You too. And go Hiller. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment on anything? I'm not seeing anyone. Um, yeah, skipped over that and went right to student council, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> it's okay. And I skipped over recognition. Are we having any recognitions tonight? We are not. Okay. Sorry about that. Now we're caught up to where we should be, which is our NASDAQ refresh report, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Please come up, Mr. Kennedy, and uh, fill us in about the updates to our enrollment and the mysteries of Hopkinton Math. Thank you. Are there any districts you visit more than ours? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Thanks for having me. And with your permission, I'd like to go through the whole report and then take all the questions at, at the sure, end. Sure. So we'll that's hold okay. our questions. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the last 10 years, you've uh, 
been growing at, at a rate of about uh, 10 students a year, so you, you grew about 100, year, 100 students in that decade, and you're on a path now to increase a little bit more than that uh, and increase by about 20 per year, so 200 over the next decade. This shows the individual grade levels, and you'll see this 35, 21 is about uh, 100 more than the previous 10 years. Uh, I'm going to skip over the individual grades, but we'll come back to that if, if we need to. Those numbers are really pretty small to, to look at, but they're, they're grouped together here in the groupings that you use within the school district for your individual schools. And this looks ahead 10 years and shows what the projection would be. Uh, sometimes people ask us what, what the uh, accuracy is. Uh, and just to refresh your memory, I'm, I'm sure the school committee knows this, but the, the K-12 total this year was uh, the, the number that NESDAQ projected plus 31 that we didn't anticipate. Uh, so you divide that by the 13 grades, K through 12, and we're off by uh, two point something per, per grade. Uh, the year before, we were off by 20. The year before that, we were off by four. The year before that, we were off by, by 43 because you were beginning to ramp up for the new housing that, that you had built. And we didn't anticipate that as many units would be occupied as quickly as they were, uh, but we're, I think, in touch with reality at this point. Uh, so this shows uh, that you will grow up from the, the uh, 3,500s to the 3,700s uh, over the next 10 years. The, uh, the first three years and, and or the first five years are the ones that you're particularly interested in, in building budgets and doing uh, long range plans. Uh, anything that goes beyond five years out is much less certain because all sorts of things can can change with, with the economy, with immigration, with all kinds of, of issues. So uh, the most reliable numbers are the ones that are the two, three, four years out. This shows a gap between the number of births you have and the number of people who show up uh, five years later for for kindergarten, and there lie therein lies a tale. You are in the top ten percent cl and close to the top five percent of New England in in school districts uh, in terms of how many people show up to kindergarten compared to how many were born there, uh, and that's. That's a feature uh, partly of how expensive homes are, but it's also partly a feature of how many people want to be here uh, and, and people want into your schools. I'll, I'll mention another uh, statistic related to that that's found on this next page. Up in this upper right-hand corner, uh, it's hard to see it on the screen, but you knew about uh, 184 uh, students who lived in in uh, Hopkinton in 2005, but whose parents were paying tuition for them to go to a parochial or private school. Now you've got uh, 125 more students, 124 more students than you had at that time, but the number who are out in private schools has dropped to 140. So. Back in 2005, uh, there were 5.3% uh, in non-public schools whose parents were paying tuition for that. Now, although the number is down total, it's only 4%. Uh, so you, you actually, while you've gained 124 students, so the school system is larger than it was in 2005, at the same time, you've dropped by 40 in the number of students whose parents are paying tuition for them to be elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So clearly they want to be in your, in your schools. Can I ask a question to understand that number? Sure. So 
our student count is up by 125. That's right. So that drop of 44 that we're seeing over time, that, that's not that many more. That It's just that we have a lower ratio of children who are going to other schools other right. than Hopkinton. You said so 125 it, is still a net you, number. You said it better okay. than I did. Okay. Yes. I, no, I don't think that's – I just wanted <laughs> yeah, to you make it. sure I was understanding the, the data. Yeah, you, you got it. Thank you. Uh, this was not in the report that the school committee received, uh, but I, when I was getting ready to do tonight's presentation, I recalled that when I was here three or four years ago, I did a chart just like this that was based on, I think, 37 years of your birth to kindergarten experience, and you liked it, so I thought I would, would bring it back again. Uh, in, in red here are the number of net move-ins, if, if it's over 30, they're, they're listed in, in red. Uh, this is, these are the school years from 1977 to 1997, so, so that's uh, more than 20 years ago. And this is the most recent uh, 20 years here. So you've got the, the birth year, the number of Hopkinton births, then five years later they show up in kindergarten, and this is how many showed up. And there was a net uh, increase of 36 that that year, uh, so, so 36 more showed up in kindergarten than had been born in Hopkinton as a Hopkinton resident uh, five years before. And what you see is that the Kathy years have been very strong and people are buying your houses uh, left and right. And <coughs> you're getting lots and lots of children into kindergarten uh, who had not been, been born here. Uh, and maybe if we really knew the ratios between births and, and kindergarten, maybe we should be selling houses instead of doing something else. But uh, it looks like this is going to continue, and, and I think there's a very good chance uh, that this is the most recent uh, school year. This, this is this year. Uh, there were uh, the 70-something the more, 76 more who showed up in kindergarten then had been born here, and we think it's going to be about uh, 84 this this coming fall, and that the numbers are going to be in that range, the 70, 80 range. And as you can see, as you look back uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was nothing like that. There were some years in which fewer showed up in kindergarten than had been born uh, five years prior in, in Hopkinton, and very few uh, years in which the numbers were up in the 30s and 40s, uh, and as they have been here, uh, 34, 54, 83, 88, 100, uh, and you know that that's the highest in the in the 41 years. So people clearly want to be here, and uh, you're getting a steady flow of uh, new families, uh, refreshing the the population of the town, and then. Uh, I just mentioned some, some factors here, but I, I intentionally put them in this kind of order because the number of real estate sales more than the number of building permits and more than the number of local births uh, are important in, as factors in making estimates. Uh, the, these are not necessarily less important, but the, they're just more complex, and so I, I listed them down here further, but all of these affect the factors that we have to look at when we estimate uh, how many students you're going to have. So I guess that's, that's essentially all the separate slides I wanted to show you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have questions? So um, on this factors to watch, so you mentioned that obviously the real estate sales, building permits, local births are the ones we can um, more easily discern. Right. For the school student accomplishments, and th I think that one in particular because we have had a lot more of the good news, mm -hmm. um, lately, how does that work into your predictive formula? Well, it's – I guess the easiest way to say it is to give it a, a bad example that doesn't apply to Hopkinton the more negative information about a school district, for, for example, if, if the school 
is in school district is in turmoil all the time because the town doesn't support the school committee or the school committee don't like each other and and have wrangles at, at school committee meetings I'm, I'm sure you you read about uh, places like that uh, and uh, thankfully that's not Hopkinton but I so I guess I'm, I'm sort of describing it in reverse but the more the more that the good news of what's getting accomplished by the school committee, by the town, by the students, the, the more that that is the news that's, that's out there, uh, that makes more people want to come here. It makes more strong faculty or a new superintendent want to come here. Uh, one of the things, you know, uh, Art Bencourt's going to be here talking with some of you tomorrow about the superintendent search. and. And one of the things that candidates, but particularly good candidates, often ask uh, the, the search firms is, you know, how much peace in the valley is there? And, and is this a place where I really could do education work? Or am I going to be caught up in political wrangles all the time? And uh, the political wrangling is not uh, the kind of thing that most really good superintendents want to deal with. And, given a choice among three or four different places, they would go to the places where they could get something really done for the kids in education, because that's why they became teachers and administrators in the first place. So so I guess that, that's sort of the two sides of, of the coin. And now with things like uh, social media, there's, there's lots of additional ways that information can get out. And the more that it's positive, uh, the more effective and self-reinforcing that can become. So I, I, so I completely understand that from an outcome perspective, mm -hmm. but I'm just thinking about it from a prediction perspective. So is there a certain amount that you look at, and I know there's probably no way to make this purely scientific, but is there a certain amount where you look at the volume of good news to bad news and adjust up a prediction, or is this purely based on the demographic trends? The, the only times that I can remember in the last, say, five years, uh, I've been doing this uh, since I retired as a superintendent, you know, almost 20 years ago. But, but uh, in in the f most recent five years, the only time I can ever remember adjusting uh, projections was was adjusting them down uh, for for reasons of bad news, like you know, the high school just lost its accreditation, you know, that that kind of thing. So you you make uh, adjustments in uh, where you think the uh, Sixth, seventh, eighth graders are likely to be going, and it's probably not to the to the local high school, or, or some portion of them may not be there. But uh, I don't remember adjusting anything upward for for that. So, uh, so for our purposes, because again, we've been fortunate to have a lot of good news of late. We should probably treat these numbers closer to a floor than. Yeah, I I, w I would say yeah because I, I, yeah cause I. I I, I think yeah. If 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 Nesdaq is going to be wrong in numbers, and actually, if you take the last four years, every even the year we were off by four, we we're we've been off on by being too low, mm -hmm. and and you've outstripped our numbers every year for the last four years. That that's not true in every school district uh, because we usually have as many highs as lows. And with you, we've had more highs than lows. Right. Um, so, and that isn't just good luck on your part. It's it's, it's planful on your part too. Oh yeah. I mean, it's it's well, and, it's, and, it, and again, it's the work of a, a lot of people sitting here. Um, so, shifting a little bit, uh, what I'm curious about is the net move-in numbers mm -hmm. have obviously gone up tremendously yes. in recent years. And I guess I'm trying to figure out how much that's a Hopkinton phenomenon, and how is do you see this kind of thing happening at other competitive school, high-performing school districts as well? Are we just getting more of like a sorting, or it's it's both? I see it in maybe five percent of the districts in in New England, but and and they're all essentially like you, where the news is good news, and more people want to buy their houses and their houses are going but but their houses are going up faster than the places 
that that aren't having the good news because when when uh, when you get a lot of good news, even if the prices are high, a lot of people will flock to the, to the good news place because they feel it's an investment. And and even as a, as a, a money making proposition, they feel they'll get their money back when the, and then some when they when they go to sell, as well as getting a good education for their child. And in some cases, I mean, realtors we talk to realtors all the time, and and they tell us that. Uh, much older, you know, retired people often ask them questions about the school system, not because they ever expect to have a, a child or a grandchild in the schools, but because they want to know if they're going to get their money back uh, if they b buy an expensive condo or an expensive house uh, in, in the town. And they check with realtors on test scores uh, or, or check wherever they can for that to see what's the reputation of the school district. And then that's a factor in their buying houses. And the realtors say, you know, 25 years ago, not that much data was available, and, and that was not a factor in buying houses for people who didn't have children. I mean, people who have children always have asked the, the school question of the realtors, but the people who don't have children n never used to ask the realtors that question. And they almost always do now and especially in the towns where the homes are expensive. So last one from me, I promise. Um, so just thematically, if I go back to the first slide, which is this, the, um, the chart, the growth chart, 20, 2007 to 2027, the, the basic story here, if I'm reading this correctly, is don't expect this to stop anytime soon. Right. We, we don't see any reason why it, why it should stop. You've got more developable land. You, you, know, you haven't used it all up uh, with the, the, the realtors. And uh, it, uh, it, it appears that it's going to continue. You know, fac factors can change, and it could, but it's just as likely to accelerate as, as it is to slow down. Okay. Uh, one thing I would just note, too, that if you, <laughs> for, for planning purposes, it's uh, next year is a big spike year on this projection. Um, so something we should think about planning for the 2019-2020 budget. I mean, we go up by 26 kindergartners alone. Is that because of the extra rooms at the new school, so now they're going to have more classes? I think, high? correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but this is based on essentially the number of four-year-olds in town. Uh, right. Yeah. But, but I will check again and make sure, because I, I know you go through several iterations of your budget, and as you get into January and February, you want to make sure that you're on target to have enough money, but not too much committed. Well, and, and this isn't for the budget we're working on now. It's for next year's budget. Right. Yeah, I'm done, sir. Anybody else have questions? I think it's a great report and very, very informative. Um, and I think very helpful for, from a planning perspective. My questions are more geared towards um, Dr. McLeod in terms of planning. Should I hold off on them or this is the time? Um, I think, are we going to cover that in budget? Okay. Um, I think they're actually, Don would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, Go for so it. I think in the, um, you know, the upcoming year for the overall projected growth is 0.3% I've seen that number. But in grades 2, 6, and 10, there are significant surges. So how will we be handling that? So this is, boy, there's feedback tonight. Does that sound weird to you guys? It sounds like she's no. being amplified it, somewhere. It does. Like, yeah, like, like, just, yeah. like there's a speaker. Um, this is where we begin, and you'll be hearing it, Mina, as we go through the individual um, reports for each of the buildings. Um, and we've been waiting and, and working with NESDEC, and thank you for of making this a priority, uh, Dr. Kennedy, um, because this is where we begin our projections in terms of class size. And when you ask about the planning, we I had referred in, in a few meetings ago that we're, we're, this is the base, and then we're also looking at trends um, in terms of how many how many move-ins have we've had have we have we had above and beyond. Um, so that's how we use this for planning, um, not so much for the years out because. Although we can we can talk about it and think about it, um, when we get into more details of individual budgets, it, it's not as relevant um, in terms of what might be happening in four years. Right. And I guess where I'm coming from is that 
while the overall number looks a certain way, but there are particular classes where the numbers are much higher. Yes. And I would think that that would pose a particular challenge in that grade in that school. It, and well, what's been interesting over time is that sometimes there's a we call it a bubble class, um, and there could be higher higher numbers there. If we're in an elementary building, that could mean lower numbers of a certain grade level in terms of being able to plan around the numbers of available classrooms. But we also need to plan around the numbers of specials, so related, related, not really, well, related services as well as specials, music, art, you're going to be hearing from tonight. Um, those have to increase accordingly. And so it's really important when we do our planning for the following year that we take those things into consideration because when we're taken by surprise in August, it's very difficult to start rearranging schedules, rearranging the numbers of special rotations are available to us. And so this is really important uh, planning. And from a visibility perspective, these like the, six, the second and sixth grade examples are, the, the sixth grade number is going up, but the actual class that's moving through is staying relatively flat. So, so, that's true. Like, so sixth grade goes up from 234 to 281, but that 281 is actually, is actually 278. Mm -hmm. So that fifth grade becomes next year's sixth grade. Right. So it's not like we got 50 new kids. But S even still, I was looking at the fourth grade numbers. Yeah. Uh, um, this year's fourth grade, when they were in kindergarten, the class was 192 kids. Yeah. Yep. This year, it's 262 kids. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and it looks like we've mm -hmm. added a class. A, a classroom a year, mm -hmm. every year in the last three years, essentially, right? 62 kids, mm -hmm. roughly a class a year. Mm -hmm. So there's a tipping point somewhere. So this <laughs> I would suspect. I mean, when they come, <laughs> right. So that's when right. they come, they, they're invited in. The, these are the struggles and these of, are the conversations right, right. that we have in terms of th there is, and how do we plan for that, and thinking about, as we'll be talking more in January, how do we plan for this enrollment across all of our buildings? Right. Um, especially as we be begin to think about the potential of another building, thinking outside the box in terms of how that could accommodate yeah. some grade changes um, where there's more in one grade and less in another. Um, that kind of planning is really going to be important over the next five years. Before I leave you, I want to mention something that I've written that's not as clear as it ought to be. It says full day kindergarten began in 2010, and it shows that asterisk right there. <laughs> what it should say is that in 2010, full day kindergarten as an option for some children began then, and those children are now in seventh grade. And in 2014, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Is when you began full day kindergarten right. for, for all children. Right. Mm -hmm. And my suspicion, if you're like other districts that uh, I'm aware of who have done this, uh, you probably are do, needing to do less remediation of beginning reading and beginning math uh, compared to what was the case 10, 15 years ago uh, because of the fact you, you've added that gift of time to the kindergarten teachers. Uh, I have to say this because my daughter's a kindergarten teacher. There you go. I thought there might be something in there. Oh. So, so uh, that would be a, a clearer way of saying something that I somewhat misstated. Thank you. And so just for our understanding, if you don't mind going to slide number five. I don't know how clearly it's visible, but if you look from uh, you know the bottom right table, you have the 2017-18 number, and then you have the 2018-19, right. and you're showing a difference of 12, which is the 0 0.3 increase overall. Mm -hmm. and when I look at the same, uh, you know, up top, I'm looking at line number two, which is 2018-19, and going into each of the grade levels, that is what is the projected increase per class size between the 1718 and 1819 because when i look at the last column the pk to 12 that's the difference uh, the 3521 to 3 um, 3462 to 3474 which is the 12 mm -hmm. 
So to me, it seems like for each class, that's the increase that's being projected per grade. Is that right? Well, some, some go up and some go down. So the, sure. the knowing what the K-12 number is and how that differs, the, the, um, the, the K-12 total from one year to the next is influenced more than anything else by how large was the graduating class of 12th graders who left in June compared to how large was the class of kindergartners who showed up in September to replace them. And, and that, that gives you the difference, much of the difference. Uh, if nobody moved in, nobody moved out, that would be the only thing that was, that was uh, a factor. So it's really uh, an apples and oranges kind of discussion. It, it, and I agree with you from a parent point of view or a teacher point of view or a principal point of view, it's important to ask how many third graders are we going to have next year in our school where we had second graders this year and do we need more teachers or not as many teachers and, and that operationally uh, and, and how are we going to teach them? That, that was the basic question you asked and, and that's what you really need to ask about. But when you start planning budgets, you get into charts like I make, and those are helpful to business managers, but not very helpful to principals and individual teachers who are trying to, to do the planning on a day-to-day -day basis, because it's a slightly different problem. But you're asking a really good question, because if it doesn't get settled at the teacher and principal level, it doesn't get and, and, and parent level, if it doesn't get worked out right there, that's what makes the difference to the children. Thank you for explaining that. Anybody else? Thank you for asking the question. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have to say the way that the charts on pages two, three, and I think six, because of the 500 student increment, look so much less scary. <laughs> they look so much flatter than they feel, or they, you know, than, than I feel like we experience them. It just visually, when I looked at them, I was like, this can't be right. This doesn't bad. look like a bad thing at all. And then, mm, it's not a bad thing. We love kids, but it yeah. doesn't look like a dramatic, the dramatic increase it feels like we have been experiencing. So then I mm. had to stop and realize why that was. So. Well, thank you for having can, me. Sorry, can I lob one last one in, because you reminded me of something. When you were talking about the full day kindergarten, I know I said I was done, but I often lie. Um, the, so one thing that since we implemented full day kindergarten that I've been expecting, but I'm starting to let go of that expectation, is that we would get a flattening between kindergarten and first grade. And so I'm still seeing in these projections, like for 2017 to 18 to 2018, 19, you have that class moving up by 24 students between kindergarten and first grade. Is that something we should just expect in perpetuity? Well, you're, you got this year a 14% um, a move in from, from kindergarten to first grade, and, and you've been continuing to get that growth. So that's, that's part of the, 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 the real estate tale where people um, – would have wished to be in here when the child was born, but they didn't do it or they couldn't afford it. So they did get here by the time of kindergarten, but some people didn't make it then. They didn't get here till first first grade year. So maybe they weren't that far into their career and yet ready to buy a house of, of this expense or whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, I. I if there were no other factors working, when you, when you go to full-day kindergarten, a district usually exper uh, experiences very little uh, growth in the number of students from K to 1. But because you've got so many people buying houses and moving in, you're getting them there and, and maybe even later, second grade, third grade. But, okay. but you, you're, you're continuing to to see that as, as long as as lots and lots of houses are, are selling, uh, you're going to continue to. Right. So if the real estate flattened out, you, you'd 
see it flattened because you don't have people putting kids in private kindergarten as much because they can right. get the that's, full day option. Right. But the yep. movement, the, the rate of move-ins yep. and house selling is what's going to keep that volatile because right. of that. Okay, that actually that makes sense. Thank you. I'm really done now. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Well, we thank really you. Appreciate it, and it's good information to have as we start to discuss how we're going to provide services that all of these students require. <laughs> which nice. is our next test. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see Thank you. Very Thank, much. You. Thank you. Um, sure. We can, we're going to do a little shuffling of the order and also just thinking in terms of finding a place for everybody to sit. Maybe if Rebecca, because you're the only appropriations and or or a second person, do you, do you, is it okay if she sits next to of Susan? Of course, please. And then we, and that way the presenters can sit together over there. Does that go, does that work well? So um, I was just thinking we can, uh, or Kathy just suggested, let's, for people who are here, let's take yours first so that you can, you're not stuck here for the whole night. Do you have a, a preference, Dr. McLeod, about uh, who goes I, first? Actually, I thought we could invite, um, all three of them. Okay. Up together. All right. There's more than three. Oh, so which so three do you like select? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, if we can have Mr. Hay, Miss Giannino, and Miss King, that would be great. And okay. So we will start with the arts. May I say something? Yes. So welcome. Hello. Thank you for Hello. being here tonight. I wanted to um, explain to the school committee how things are a little bit different this time than how we've done it in the past and why. Um, so in the past, the arts and music budgets have been part of the secondary reports. Um, and so in your binders, you do have the, the printouts, and Rebecca has a copy of the high school and middle school, school budgets. And although we're not taking that up tonight, um, we did want you to have the details of, the, of the, the, how that's called out. Um, as it turns out, and as you are well aware, we anticipate having quite a lengthy discussion on the 30th um, as a follow-up to our transportation discussion. Um, and in, in seeking a balance within our budget presentations going forward, um, it seemed like a good opportunity to have um, th these budgets discussed tonight. So the, the, when we have the secondary, Alan and Evan, come on the 30th, um, I wanted to, I thought it was really important publicly and also for you um, to have our subject matter leaders here um, to answer any questions that you may have around it. Um, and although they don't have reports as, as per se, um, you will see some increases in those lines. And I thought it was really important for you to have them here to ask any questions of. Um, Dee does have an overview, so maybe we'll um, we'll start with Colleen, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so as a whole, um, some of you know this, just to remind all of you, the art department services first grade through 12th grade. Um, so as a whole department, we are only asking for a $640 increase as a whole from first grade to 12th grade. Um, the increase comes primarily from the high school budget, where we're asking for an increase of $1,224. Um, one of these increases is for one new bifold display for our art show that has grown and expanded, and that is roughly around $500 just for two parts to the bifold. Um, the rest of the increases are things like acrylic brushes, foam board, colored pencils, exacto knives and mat cutters, um, clay, glaze, and maintenance. Um, and a lot of these things, I do have to say, were really resourceful, first grade through 12th grade. We're artists, we know how to make a lot with a little. Um, and we've been very mindful about keeping things intact and using things till we can no longer use them. So we need some updated materials. Also costs have, in, have increased at the high school. Um, we tend to look for some more sophisticated materials. Um, things like specialty markers have run their course already. We lost um, tech bid pricing on some of our clay, so we need to account for that fluctuation in cost. 
Um, and there were a few things we did decrease, some of the line items. You'll see we decreased our acrylic paint, our map board, our digital printing papers. You know, We try to take as best inventory as we can to anticipate for a year from now. Um, the middle school dynamic media budget decreased by $640. Um, we are hoping we're able to get the additional sort of big ticket items that we had initially put with the remaining funds we have left for this school year. Um, and the studio art budget at the middle school just increased by $80. Uh, Elmwood, Hopkins, and Center are staying level. They're staying the same that they have been for the last two, years or so we've we increased the Hopkins budget a little bit um, last year and the year before because it had been cut really low prior so we've got that back up to where we need it to be um, that's that. so yeah I mean I think just just all of this an example of responsible budgeting while maintaining fabulous program and and one of the things when you talk about the bifold Colleen what comes to mind for me is this this change that you've made to the art show where you've invited in participants from all grade levels um, and how exciting that is for kids and that requires more display space it does and they're getting a little more wear and tear we've shared them with center school so that they can do their art show to go with the book fair um, initially they were purchased and funded by the PTA so you know, they're just kind of getting old now. And that was actually me, so that was... <laughs> Thank you, Jean. <laughs> no, it's but my, my point is that had to have been at least 10... When I was in the PTA, oh. so it had to have been at least 10 years yeah. ago. And we well, bought thanks. them from a business that was going out of business, so they weren't new at that point. That's the <laughs> only reason I mentioned that. Like, you've, you've made them work for a long time, so kudos. Thanks. Th don't they go on the road sometimes, too? Is that... They... Well, we have... Well... I'm trying to. We brought. I think we've brought them to the HCA from time to time, but yeah. but they do have to get hauled in the trucks over to to the auditorium, right. um, to the gymnasium at Center School at the end of the school year right. for the the show. And we used them to partition off some of the new furniture displays to yeah. the beginning of the year. So, are there any questions for? Colin? Yeah. Any other any questions? questions? No. Awesome. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. Um, and you probably want to stay and support your colleagues. We understand the feel. Okay. <laughs> Some of Craig so, next. Craig, do you want to go? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, Craig Hay, representing the music department. Um, our budget is K through 12. Um, we've worked really hard to try to maintain and uh, keep as things level funded, but we do have some increases. And these increases are based on one of the, our biggest things that we have in the music department, and that's our instrument inventory. Um, unfortunately, we're at a point where some of the high maintenance costs for our instruments are outweighing the value of the instrument itself. Um, we have many instruments that have survived 30 to 40 years of students here in Hopkinton. Um, we were lucky when we were a smaller district. We were able to just purchase things here and there when we needed them. Um, but we were only getting one instrument at a time or two instruments at a time. And now we're at a point where while we've amassed a good collection of instruments, we are finding that we can't maintain some of them. Uh, two years ago, Mr. Keller, uh, or last year, Mr. Keller allowed our staff to go over to David French Music and get trained in music maintenance so that we could actually take care of a lot of stuff in-house. Um, but unfortunately, we have some instruments that have taken quite a beating and um, we have to wait usually sometimes a fiscal year before we can send them in for the amount of repair work that needs to be done. Um, so you will see in our budget this year that at the middle school level and at the high school level we have some instrument requests um, that we can adjust if needed uh, but like at the high school I have requested a F attachment trombone to replace a 40 year old instrument. Um, we have more students, we have more students who want to play these instruments, and I would like to have good instruments in their hands so that they, they can play. Um, last year, and thank you, we added an additional baritone saxophone because we had six students sharing four instruments. So uh, now that's, we're able to, to do a little bit more with that. Um, one of the other things, too, is at the middle school, we've requested more cellos. This year, uh, with the middle school, um, 
thanks to French music and thanks to the lease that we had a few years ago. Uh, we do have enough instruments so kids don't need to bring them back and forth, but we've had to share the instruments that we have there. So we have a sixth grader, a seventh grader, and an eighth grader assigned to one cello because their classes don't meet at the same time. Those instruments are getting played every day by a student from each grade level. So uh, while it's nice to see the numbers increase in our orchestra program and see so many kids playing cello because they know that they don't have to bring them back and forth on the bus, um, we, we're running short of instruments and we're dividing instruments between three grade levels of children. So that's where we're at. I just want to point out in, in there for those of you who may may remember just how creative Craig has been in meeting the demand, um, particularly for cellos. And I don't, it was along with French music, you were able to figure a way of getting. Yeah, they um, lent us Okay. <laughs> um, at least so far a dozen cellos um, that they've taken out of their rental uh, program yeah. that they're either older or um, they had some repair work done and they don't want to rent those out to students anymore. They use them as repair loaners. Um, they've given us at least a dozen cellos over the last uh, four years to use to help cover this situation. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have questions? Can I ask you a fast question just for my, my own understanding? Do the kids rent and own some of their instruments as well? or They do. And the school provides some, and is there any, the is reason, it the larger instruments? It's or is the it larger the instruments okay. that can't go on the bus. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So a lot of students, what we try to do is to give them uh, an instrument that they can use in school so that we're not forcing parents to have to do additional transportation or um, make it difficult on the families. You know, we want the children to continue. We want them to enjoy the experience. And this just gives them an opportunity to do that. And I was part of all of that um, challenge. At what was really mm. compelling to me, having been a saxophone player, um, that would have fit on the bus, is that this dilemma about you know kids having to choose a flute over a cello because it would fit on the bus. Right. So we wanted kids to be able to play the instrument that they were really passionate about wanting to play. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, did you say the amount of change in your budget and I missed it? That's um, entirely possible. So we've added uh, this year at the high school level, there's a couple areas that we've added a little bit more. Uh, one is our music text budget. And text for us is not a book. Text is a piece of music, uh, a folder with basically with all the parts. Um, those prices have gone up dramatically over the last four years. Uh, we're now looking at pretty much $100 per piece that we purchase. Uh, we utilize our library for every concert. We try to balance it out of two-thirds older music that we've had, that we've used, and we're going to reshuffle in for kids to learn uh, with one new piece so that we're constantly expanding the library so that we have more to choose from. But we're always drawing off our library uh, so that we have pieces of music that we uh, feel will present the students with enough challenges for for really good learning curve and great performances at the end of our, our, our teaching cycle. Okay. Does it? I didn't even ask Mike and Rogue. Did you have questions for either? I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but do you have any can, ballpark figure how many students are participating in the music program? Currently, five through twelve, we are just under a, a thousand. And art is and for art, every kids. every student, every first grader is seen at center school. So it'll be every first grader at, at, at Marathon, and then um, at Hopkins, Elmwood, and the middle school, every child gets art. Um, they actually have two art classes at the middle school, and then at the high school, we see this year we are servicing 770 students, so over 60 percent of the high school population you guys knew that too. <laughs> and Craig, I think, I mean, so you are, were you talking about instrumental, the instrumental I was program? talking about everything, instrumental, choral, yeah. any of our performance groups. All of our students take music um, K through 8. Yeah. So all students have that. And then at the high school level, um, we would have, we're just over 220 students involved in the music program alone. 
So. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? I have a question, but I wanted to make a comment both on the art and the music. Are the programs that you put out, both of you, for art and music, are of such high caliber across the district? It really is something to see the kids and watch them develop through the grades. So, thank you. And there is a wonderful set of, of December concerts coming up for all grade levels. Um, so, stay tuned. Yes. Right. And once again, thank you for your continued support of yes. our art and our music oh, programs. Yes. Uh, we're very, very lucky to be here that we have enough teachers in our program to continue to grow the students, that we have supportive principals, and um, that stems from you and the, the, the community. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And am I right? You'll be at Gillette uh, in the event. That would be awesome. Hoping. <laughs> You can't ready. go if they don't go. So. <laughs> no pressure, D. <laughs> no pressure, D. <laughs> I just have one comment. Uh -huh. I really appreciate your creativity in keeping um, the costs low, the increases low. I, I certainly reflect what Nancy is saying, and also the importance of art and music. Um, I think we should keep that in mind always, and I hope we don't cut down on any of the programs for the kids. Am I up? Yes, you uh, are. <laughs> um, so in athletics this year, um, you're, uh, does everyone have the executive summary? Yes, oh, yes. and they've so, read it. Okay, okay. Yep. So um, obviously there are some increases this year, which I just want to um, go over. And, you know, in, in many areas we're trying to stay right where we've been. But um, one of the big areas of focus this year um, that wasn't necessarily built into the budget last year purely because personally in my first year in the role I hadn't seen the full scope of a year to realize what um, where some of the need was. Um, so in terms of our personnel additions um, this year, all of them were for safety and supervision reasons based on the number of participants that we have in the programs. Um, so, so some of those personnel additions include two middle school cross country <coughs> coaches, um, because we have over 90 kids that are participating in the middle school cross country team, and, and thanks to you, we did add um, a temporary second position this year, which was so incredibly helpful. But to have a 30 to one um, athlete to coach ratio is still a lot, but absolutely reasonable. Um, but this year, to have almost 45 to one, that's a lot when kids are spread out all over the place. Um, so we did rely this year on some parent volunteers and, and people sort of to go throughout the course, but um, really we should be able to have three coaches so that two are at different stations and one's actually on the move to, to monitor the kids. Um, similar reasons um, requesting a high school winter track assistant coach and a spring track assistant coach, very same reasons. Um, lots of kids in the winter, we have um, 120 to 130 participants, and the same in the spring. Uh, and, and we do have a few coaches on staff, but due to the numbers, we have four coaches on staff, but with the numbers um, and the fact that they are in all different locations, the coaches have expressed to me last year and then this year that it's very challenging to manage that number of student athletes. And it also is dependent on what event that the student athletes are doing. So there are times where one coach could have 50 kids in that event um, and so they said it's hard to give instruction when you're managing that many kids and not having any support um, so that's where that request is coming from um, and then the other two are in thinking about incorporating the alpine ski team into the operating budget which um, we're hoping mm -hmm. happens and gets approved um, we are requesting a head varsity coach and also an assistant coach um, last year we had 17 participants on the team, which at first glance you think one person can manage that, but when you look at the um, scope of a mountain, to have two people there, someone at the top or someone mid-mountain or at the, at the bottom is really important. I spoke with our coach and she actually has at this point 23 uh, student athletes signed up for ski this year, which is awesome. So. That's, that's good growth from last year, and it was incredibly successful last year. So in terms of the personnel requests, again, besides Alpine Ski, it's purely for supervision and safety reasons that those requests are being put forward. 
um, when we move on to the non-payroll portion of the budget, um, there is at this point a significant increase in the supply line. And that is, I can pretty much attribute that to two things. Um, one of the areas of focus that has been discussed by um, Susan, Kathy, and me has been the addition of AEDs for our athletic teams. And um, from a state standpoint, it is not a mandate yet, but they're moving in the direction of requiring an AED to be present with each athletic team. Um, and so when we projected out how many we need and where that number 33,000 came from, there are 26 fall athletic teams. That is the, um, the, that's the most per season. So in terms of covering each team for the fall, we'd be able to then pass along the AEDs to the other seasons. Um, and again, from a safety standpoint, it's something that it's a big number at first glance, but when you think about what it, could potentially be doing. Um, it's it seems like, from my standpoint, a no brainer because we just we obviously want to make sure that our student athletes and and everyone really um, in the vicinity is protected. And so when you think about the travel and all the people at various events, there are times when if you look at the layout of our um, of our school and our fields and things like that. Our athletic trainer isn't at every location and there can sometimes be a six to ten minute gap for someone to get from point A to point B. So to be able to have um, an AED with a coach on site is just something that would really protect us and put us in a, in a great spot. Um, hopefully we would never ever have to use any of them, um, but it's something that, you know, there have been horrible, horrible tragedies because an AED hasn't been accessible to um, a team or an athlete. So that's that's a big portion of the increase, but one that um, we feel is really important. The other big increase in the supply line um, is football uniforms. Um, so you're looking at 80, about 80 student athletes, um, and so it's a big cost. The cost, the estimate um, was about $27,000. And so when I spoke with um, other athletic directors in the Tri-Valley League to get a sense of, you know, how often do you do your uniform turnover? How does it work? Uh, most of them were getting new uniforms every three years uh, for their football team and all their teams. Um, and for us, it's been six years since our football team got uniforms. Um, and we're still, when, with the uniform cycle I created, um, we're pushing it to four, maybe five years to try to spread it out and make the uniform part of the budget. Um, stay consistent year after year, but given the fact that they've um, been operating at a little bit of a deficit and, and they are a little bit behind, this year we're definitely in need of football uniforms um, from a distance. I think they look okay, but when we get up close, um, they're torn, the numbers are, are peeling off, um, and so, you know, it's something where that's just the biggest line item from the uniform standpoint. There are other teams requesting uniforms, but the n numbers are much more manageable given um, the size of the teams because many of them pass down varsity to JV and so <coughs> on. With football, you can't do that because they're all on the sidelines together. So there's not that same pass down and they all have to be in the same uniform. Um, so those are the, the biggest increases in the supply line. Um, we requested an increase in our event staff um, account and there, this is there's sort of two parts of this one um, with potentially more games that would we would be <clears throat> hosting if if there is a potential installation of turf fields um, would have more night games more need for event staff um, hopefully gates would offset that um, but it's hard to plan without knowing exactly what's going to happen. So that is a, um, a request that has to do with a little bit of planning ahead, but also comparable, um, comparable rates in all of the other Tri-Valley League towns. Right now we pay the lowest for our event staff of anyone, and it's a challenge actually to get um, people to work. So for example, we pay $40 for a ticket taker. Other towns are paying $60 at, on an average. Um, so 
we're very fortunate that some of our really dedicated people will, will do it, but it's it's a little bit easier to, to get people to work um, when we're paying at a comparable rate, and um, it's a question that comes up all the time. So it's it's a request, and recognizing certainly that our um, that the athletics budget is is has a, a lot of increases, requested increases. You know, it's something that. Um, I could certainly look at, but I felt like I had to request based on um, the fact that it's been even for a number of years, um, and, and our event staff continually ask about that. Um, <clears throat> when we go on to the contracted services increase, um, some of this is just the normal um, increase that results from the, the cost increases by our different um, uh, contractors but a few other reasons for this increase um, athletic trainer EMT and police coverage in the past two years we have had because of our um, successful teams which credit to our student athletes and, and coaches we have gone way into the postseason for many of our um, teams and typically you're budgeting for a couple games in the tournament but when you keep going right now we have three programs that are continuing over a month after the regular season ending which is a awesome and financially it's a big increase um, and so because we've had consistent success in our teams that's something that we've needed to take into account um, from busing officials um, all those factors that contribute to the contracted services account also um, for example by hosting a number of our three actually playoff football games, that's a huge expense with our EMT requirements, um, police cover, police detail and coverage, um, and those <coughs> kinds of things. And it's just something that um, we felt was important to plan for because we did not plan for it last year, um, and we're going to have to try to cut in some other areas this year to account for the extra that we've needed to spend. Um, the last piece of that, um, there, are, there are two parts of it. We have adopted the music and core, or we're hoping to adopt the music and choreography piece of our cheerleading team into the athletics budget. I'm not sure um, how it had gone this way in the past, but it has been paid for by um, parents, and it's it's a pretty significant cost. It's it's the choreography itself is twenty five hundred dollars. The music is nine hundred dollars because it all has to be custom um, done, and so I feel like. When we look at everything across the board, it seemed to me not, it seems something that should be in the budget as opposed to asking parents um, to be paying for that. So that was built into this year's request. And lastly, planning for proper uh, maintenance on some of our um, equipment, our fitness equipment in the fitness center, along with um, scoreboards and things like that, um, because fixing of goals things that there are certain things that we've been so fortunate with um, Tim and his staff have been able to do internally and we're so lucky for that but then there are certain things that we need to bring in a contractor to fix um, and that was something that wasn't in a in a part of the budget line before so that we wanted to add so recognizing that's a long summary there but recognizing that it's a significant increase but one that from my perspective isn't um, extraneous requests, their operational requests. Um, it's I, I tried to really look at this from a holistic standpoint and figure out, okay, this is a big increase. Why is it a big increase and how can, how can we figure it out? Um, and so I was looking at our user fees, which I know is definitely um, a sensitive topic and one that we're so fortunate to have had a user fee that's at $110 uh, per student athlete per season by far the lowest in the Tri-Valley League, um, but trying to figure out how other schools are operating with certain things that we don't have or having a uniform cycle that turns over e every three years or those kinds of things. Um, what I did was took a survey of the TVL athletic fees, um, and the next lowest after ours was, um, let's see, $220 was Millis. Um, and everything was up from there and I do have a table I don't know if that was that part was put into your executive okay. summary just to get a sense and, and lots of schools do it different ways some do it per sport some have a cap um, some just have a flat fee and then a cap um, so to cover the the increase 
a portion of it, um, I was proposing increasing the user fee to $200 with a $1,200 annual cap, which would still put us as the lowest in the Tri-Valley League. Um, but in order to hopefully bring us up to speed with, with where we're at and knowing that, for example, the AED cost is a one-time cost, a football uniform cost is not an annual cost, um, that hopefully that will contribute to helping offset the, the, some of our operational costs while still keeping a very reasonable user fee. So um, we are at this point, um, the athletic department I think is functioning really well but has some gaps that need to be, to be filled, hence the increase. So um, I know Colleen and Craig didn't get many questions. So <laughs> I'm guessing I'm going to have one or two, um, but certainly prepared for that. So appreciate you taking the time to to listen to a lengthy a lengthy presentation, but also certainly know that um, you have you would like an explanation of these numbers, and I'm happy to clarify or answer anything that I possibly can for you. Does anybody want to start? I had a, a, a just quick question. Absolutely. So with regard to the cheer, I'm assuming those athletes are paying the same athletic fee. Yeah. And, and on top of that, they're also paying Correct. for the okay. Yeah. And then the other question I had about the fees, and the same may actually be a Susan question, but for students who are not able to pay a two hundred dollar fee or even mm -hmm. one hundred and ten, do, does the district offer some financial? There, there is financial assistance. Yeah. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. And we do offer that, and actually built that into our. Um, when I projected the numbers of how many student athletes we have, what the current user fee is versus what the proposed was, we did factor in in terms of what projected it would be, how many waivers roughly we have per year. I, I know fees are sort of a dirty word to, to bring up, and it's, yep. it's a hard, Absolutely. hard way to figure out how to do it. And Absolutely. It is helpful to have the comparison of the other schools in the area, so I appreciate that. Um, but it, I also appreciate the thought going into it to be able to account for students who are not able to... Thank you. Thank you. So, for the AEDs, mm -hmm. is there um, are we going to need to get more people certified yeah. in utilization for them? Every coach is certified. Every coach is already certified. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's I a requirement. Actually, remember that from the previous thing yep. that you say. Um, the increase in event staff for the turf field, but you also have in here um, use of Fruit Street. Is, are oh, we yeah. expecting that that will Fruit Street will go down? Um, it it should go if okay. That's a great question. If the turf fields are um, something that we get installed, then the field hockey use of Fruit Street would go away. The spring use of Fruit Street would go away. And my thought on that would be that it would um, you know if other teams wanted to use it and it was available at times that they could fundraise for that and use fruit street if for some reason the turf was accounted for but it should be we shouldn't need it okay so well i'm obviously i want to remain optimistic on the turf field so it's it's so between the increased event staff or fruit street usage it's kind of one or the other right one of the one of those will come out depending yep. on the outcome of the turf field is that fair okay um and I know it might not be like exactly one for one. Mm -hmm. um, on the fee question, yes. So, do we have? And I don't know if this is. I'm going. <laughs> I'm here. Um, do we know? So, going from one ten to two hundred, what what's the revenue difference we're looking at there? I can tell you. See, I've been. I have that. Um, it's a race. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so currently the user fee is one ten, um, and this isn't. This is the total number of user fees paid, so some of these are repeat student right. athletes, but it was um, 1432. So that produced a revenue of $157,520. If we went up to 200, it would produce $286,400 with a difference of $128,880. Okay. Does that and make sense? It does. The $1200 annual cap is that a, is that a family cap? 
Yeah, it would be a family Because it would cap. have to be, right? Yeah, so family cap. Like, so, you, you know, when you have... You have kids playing six sports. We do have yeah. families here that have yeah. three kids that are playing three sports. It's bro- a lot. Brother and sister who were Athlete of the Week. A couple <laughs> <of> <laughs> we did. Yeah. yeah, and they have a few more coming up. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so we did think it was important to have that for those families that have multiple children. So if I look at the detail in here, is the offset projection assuming level fees? Because it's lower than previous years. The offset projection is more in line to the revenue that's coming in. Okay. So in previous years, we've used the uh, revolving account for other things as well. Not just coaches. We've bought, um, I believe, a Gator yep. w- was purchased in a previous year. Wrestling met part, part but of so, the wrestling. But so, so on the projection of revenue was... 200 something so we did not account you did not account that's what i'm wondering so you did this basically on 110 exactly okay that that makes so of this two hundred and thirteen thousand dollar increase fy18 to fy19 you'd look at at least at least half of that would be potentially absorbed by the revenue increase that we'd get off of this correct so another suggestion that i um spoke to um with both uh Dr. McLeod and, um, was the fact that there is potential you could also advocate for pulling the AEDs out and putting them as a capital item because it is a one-time purchase. The, the uniform replacement plan, that is part of a cycle that will continue. Um, but the AEDs are a one-time purchase that could make sense to pull out and be part of a, a capital request. And then that would bring the the full amount of the operating increase down to about 50000 with the combination of user fees. and So and something 80, for the 80, committee 80, 000, to consider. It's $80,000, so and from a capital perspective, it fits the number, but could we even do that at this point? We did check. Okay. And we can. Um, we do it today? Because mm-hmm. uh, we already timeline. submitted. Does, no. is there a... We did check to make yeah, sure. I, I mean, the, I mean the, war- the, the capital and warrants aren't finalized for no, no, a I while. Know. We submitted our yeah. list. We right. did. Right. And I, I, I did um, speak with the finance director, and he said that, you know, they would be open to that, to adding it. Okay. So it could be something that you could vote at your next meeting. Okay. But it's something for you to consider. So the one comment I'll have, I'm done with questions. The, the one comment I have is, is you know, I, I've obviously I've been on the committee that the, five years I've been on the committee, we've been steadily reducing fees across the board. Um, so it is. it would be a shift to go towards increasing a fee. That being said, obviously looking at this, I mean, we're not the lowest in the Tri-Valley League. We're a complete outlier in terms of, of the amount that, that we charge. Um, I, I do, I will say, I will comment that it, 110 to 200 feels like a really drastic increase, though. It feels like there could be a lot of, of sticker shock in the district if we go up by essentially, I mean, 100%. going up by 80, 80%. <clears throat> I mean, it's, um, so I, I wonder if there might be an opportunity to think about something a little bit more kind of in the middle. Mm-hmm. But I know that that just plays into how much are we willing to put into the mm-hmm. into the. Perspective wise, too, though, the youth sports, and I'm not, this is not an original thought, but the youth sports in town costs more than the one season in youth sports costs more than the annual fee or the or excuse me the the uh, those it's per sport correct yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. i mean to, to sign up for your hopkinton youth soccer yeah. costs more than yeah so so i mean perspective is important too like I, it is a big jump but if your kid plays two kids play two seasons of soccer it would be the same thing yeah no you know? that's a, that's a really good point yeah, yeah and I also think my impression of looking at your budget was you have a great ambition for the athletic department, and I'm really, really impressed with what you put forward. And I think in that light, with the ask that you have, and I think asking for a fee that's very reasonable, um, and compared to all the other towns, I think $200 is very comparable. So I think that's, that's great. Um, now, in terms of AEDs, uh, are they all new? Do we not have any at all at the moment? Um, at the moment, the athletic department has three AEDs, okay. um, and so one stays with our athletic trainer. We have one that sometimes goes to Hopkinton State Park for our cross-country meets, um, and we have one right outside the athletic trainer's door. So that's kind of actually 
the high school's AED, um, yeah. but it's accessible to athletics right by the gym. <clears throat> And also, you spoke a little bit to the event staff pay rate increases. Will some of the other details come in in the more detailed sessions, or this is this is the one? The yeah. details of what those rates actually would be or what they are. Right, what you're proposing. Yeah. I think you spoke mm -hmm. to the forty to yep. sixty. Yep. Um, yep. So I can. I have. Um, a table on it that I can just there's really just a few positions so that we have essentially four positions we have a ticket taker position a game administrator position which basically is crowd control a clock clock operator and then an announcer um, and those vary sport to sport based on the needs right now our ticket takers make about um, they make 40 and I put the increased fifteen dollars to fifty five our game admin makes sixty right now if I may oh, interrupt sure. are oh, they per, per hour or how does that per work? event okay yes yep, yep. Okay. so it would be um, based on the event and there is a um, we do have a sheet that accounts for a few of the outlier days working Thanksgiving and um, you know there are certain for example there are certain games where we'll have one person work a JV um, basketball and a varsity basketball so their rate isn't doubled for working the two games but it's almost like a time and a half if you will because they're there for two games um, and in the winter is really the only time that you need event staff for sub varsity games we, we need them from middle school all the way up to varsity um, for basketball for example you need clock operators and scoreboard operators and those kinds of things and uh, the reason why I was also asking is overall it's about fifteen thousand dollar change, mm -hmm. and when we move from forty to sixty, we are increasing it by fifty percent. Yep. Right. So I, I guess it all goes into the perspective. Yep. Of where all are we asking for increases? Yep. Um, and then the athletic fees. Now, did I get the? Uh, could you just repeat the overall number that we would be able to offset by with sure. the increase in the fee? Mm hmm. So um, with the increase in the fee, it would be um, $128,880. $128,000. So the two thirteen dollars would come down drastically. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a couple questions, but I can go last. You guys good? Um, so the... I'm not sure I'm understanding correctly the, um, about the contracted services account. Mm -hmm. So does this increase the athletic trainers? So, for example, if we don't have turf fields next year and we're still playing um, field hockey at Fruit Street, there would be athletic trainer on site plus whatever soccer games were going on? Not at every it, Not, not at, every at everyone. Game. Okay. Can I ask a follow up on that? Yep. So, in the event that the there are no turf fields, and yep. I, I'm guessing that's what happened this year, the I know sometimes the athletic trainers over on Fruit Street, but there are also games going on here. Is in there, practices, yeah. In in practices, mm -hmm. is there some coverage or anything in case an athlete has a? Well, there have been a few instances where I've gotten coverage. For example, if we had um, there was. A day we had football here, which our, an athletic trainer is required by law to be at football, um, and we had a boys and girls soccer games. Just likelihood of injury high, um, so we hired someone on that day. But in general, it was for me a major concern this year to not have an athletic trainer accessible. Um, even though it's a little bit far to get from field one to field thirteen, it's still on the same campus right. with a golf cart. Um, when you're at Fruit Street, it's a 20-minute drive, as you as you yeah, all know, <laughs> depending on the time of day, right? So, um, so one thing that we were really fortunate to have last year that we didn't have this year is last year it was a split position. So even though it was one position, we had two athletic trainers doing that, and together they were fantastic and, quite frankly, worked way more than a 1.0 position. They covered any double games that were happening they covered everything and so when one retired this year the position stayed the same but it's one person and she goes above and beyond but she's one body um so in the past we've been very fortunate to be covered and it's something that um 
Sue and I have talked about a lot is, is our coverage and um, what we want to have, what's, what we legally have to have. Right. Um, because this year there were a few times that I didn't feel comfortable at times that we didn't have coverage, so that was part of the increase too. So with the athletic training specifically, um, partially due to the fact that we only have one person now. So if she's not here, or in the past, if, for example, if Jeanette couldn't work, Maura would just cover. It was just, we had one day last year, I think one event last year that I had to get someone here in a whole year, which is crazy. You know, so we were very fortunate. So part of it was location, and part of it is just the fact that if she has, if she's sick or something, I have to try and scramble to get someone to come from an outside agency. So in the sorry, I am jumping no, okay. in here, but in the event that the turf fields are not built, is that maybe a budget consideration down the line that would need to be considered to make sure you can have coverage on multiple? I would, I would say yes. I would love that. It's, and that's Safety trying to concerns. figure out what is really we would really like versus what's required. It's not required to have an athletic trainer at soccer. Wow. I think every single one of us in this though? room probably knows how many injuries occur at a soccer game. Yeah, yeah. And so like it's not required either. So the only one it's actually required for is football in the fall. And then, so beyond that, it's just what we're lacrosse. Well, boys lacrosse. The best that we can do and yep. what we're comfortable with. Um, okay, so that's, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that people ask me a lot about. And I didn't actually know the answer. I know that we would all like to have more, but I wasn't sure what was required versus, yep. um, I don't even want to say nice to have because it feels required, even though maybe right. legally it's not. Yep. Um, so then my other question, well, and this is sort of a little bit of a question or a suggestion, and I'm sure you guys all are doing this, but we do have a lot of school support groups, and so I don't know if you already are working with Music Association Boosters just on some of these one-offs that, um, you know, if they can contribute to. I know they're all tremendously generous, and you work with them a lot, but to the extent that this is just such a, an unusually challenging year um, across the budget that it's it's sort of more important than ever even small things um, Absolutely. so then my, my other question really is just in terms of the personnel summary and the additions mm -hmm. is this bringing us to sort of the level of staffing that you would find at other schools I mean are we were this low in staffing compared to well the if you do it comparatively based on percentage, not overall, because we by far have the largest teams. Okay. I mean, but like it's almost a coach yes, to yes. student ratio is Correct. this is putting us more in line with. Yes, we'd still be higher. Okay. But definitely reasonable. But closer. Um, but like for example, if you see another school come to a cross country middle school cross country meet, they have twenty kids. We have ninety kids. You know, part of that's the size of the schools that we, you know, play against and things like that. Um, but we're just we have student athletes who are really excited to be part of it and just need the supervision for them. But it's a really good question. Okay. Do you have a, this is probably way outside of the corners here, but the, the numbers on how many student athletes we have roughly? It, it seems like it's growing. Well, so I don't have it because of the repeats per season. Okay, it's, sure. So we have four, 1,432 registrations. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, no, I Many of those are repeats. Are the same kid, but that's yeah, exactly. Yep. It's a lot. It's really, really high, which is awesome. And is that middle and high school? Mm hmm. So if you and, just and what's cool is that many of them are yeah, awesome. working with yes. say, to support, Craig and Colleen. To support D. One of the, the things that I, I take to the eighth graders every year is how many kids are in the band are playing sports. And generally, we are between 85 and 90 percent of the kids who are in band are playing one sport at some point awesome. during the year. Um, so, you know, t so that they do have that good balance. So, yes, yeah, she does have a lot of kids <laughs> <laughs> in the athletic program. So it just as I look at the history, you know, from FY12 to FY19, the athletic department budget has doubled. So obviously a lot of that is the staff that we're 
kind of bringing ourselves back up into a more competitive level. I know we've reduced fees in those years. Mm -hmm. um, have we also seen, and this is not a fair question to ask you now on the spot, but That's okay. does that surprise you based on what you know about the increase in this level of student participation? I mean, we certainly have more kids in the high school now than we did in 2012. Do we also have more kids, or have we, we added sports? We have more kids playing sports that's also driving that? I am not sure of that question from an overall standpoint, just because I only have last year. You I know, should this have thought year. of it before right now. Well, that's okay, but I can <laughs> absolutely look into that. I'm just curious, because um, it, it's a lot of growth, and I know yeah. that you know there's not a secret yep. trunk of money sitting under a desk or anything like that. It just, um, you know, when you actually kind of look at it year yep. over year, it kind of jumps out. Yep. Um, so in terms, I, I want to let... Uh, Mike and Rebecca also weigh in on questions, but just in terms of um, going back to that conversation about the AEDs, I just want to get a nodding of the heads. Is there um, an appetite to add that to our November 30th agenda and talk about asking for that as a capital article to take that out of this? Um, because the other reason to do that, well, we can have the discussion at that time, but if it's included in your operating budget, then you're getting that money in FY22. You're starting from a higher base in FY20 when you, I'm sure you can put the money to good use, but you don't necessarily need that big of a chunk for, um, for since it's such a one-time purchase. So is that something we want to discuss in our? Have a discussion, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so we'll add that to our um, November 30th yeah. getting meeting. getting credit for the heat money we're saving tonight? Yes, I think so. <laughs> so that's um, 33000 Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I think it's like no, 80s. Yeah. 80s or 33. Oh, the, that's right, the football uniforms, right? Right. And other variants. The 80 was the total. 80 is the total in that budget line item. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, Mike and Rebecca, did you have questions? I do actually. You guys asked a lot of them. Um, question about the AEDs and, and the number of them. Yep. If you have different teams who are using the field house, for instance. Can you have one position there that could be shared by the teams who rotate through that space? Sure. So that's a great question. That is something that we discussed. Um, and at times, the answer to that is yes. But then they're all traveling at different times. Mm -hmm. So it might work on a day that, for example, in the fall, um, volleyball and cheerleading are sharing the space in the gym. But then, you know, volleyball is off to their game. And then cheerleading is going off to a competition and they're on the same day that's where um because we thought about that and we said are there times it would just from a coordination standpoint there's going to be conflicts at different points um so that was where that that came in that number of 26. okay because i wonder if it could get trimmed down a little bit even yeah if you no, sign out when you go on a on, you know, when you're traveling um and are there any grants available for this i know in the past we've gotten grants for some of these types of Question safety um, issues i don't know if that's something anyone has looked into um i can so, look into it yeah i'm, happy to I mean, look I'm into not even it. sure to direct you but i know in the past some of those things have been covered um, the other questions I have are more about revenue, um, and I know that we have the revolving account. Is that just covering the athletic fees, and where do like gate receipts um, appear in the budget, and do they offset the athletic um, budget? So, so gate receipts and the and the fees are all okay. in the athletic revolving, and that's what, that is what's that's used what's for the there. offset. Great. And have we looked at uh, what our cost is for admission? And I I, I mean I hate to raise that because it's. You know, it, it promotes community, but sure. I'm not sure if, rather than increasing fees, if, if it raises, uh, you know, the cost by 50 cents or something, if that's something yeah. that would be another way to offset Well, it. that's one that um, actually isn't determined by the school. It's determined by the league. Oh, okay. um, so as a oh. league, we charge $5 <laughs> for adults, $3. When we are charging for an event, it's $5 for adults, $3 um, for students and seniors and children under 10 are free. Um, so it's something where it hasn't been talked about at the mm -hmm. table, the athletic directors meetings that I go to. Um, I can certainly ask um, and see what the thought is but on that's, that. But that's something we don't have much flexibility in, then we would be consistent with other right. districts mm -hmm. in the area. Okay. Um, I think that was actually it. I think it, did you have anything, Mike? Yeah, going back to the AED, the number of AEDs, I was thinking along the same lines of, as Rebecca, but 
instead of um, per location, I was thinking per season. Can't you, ha you know, for the fall season, give one to each coach, and then you use the same one for the the winter or the spring? Or if you, if there is some overlap, at least you know the volleyball in the fall does not overlap with softball in the spring, so they can be right. combined. That's the 26 is just for the fall. So they would be then passing because you have to. We have you know four teams for volleyball, four teams for field hockey. Um, so the 26 was total just fall teams. Is that was that your question? That so was my question. Are, I, I, I didn't yeah. realize okay. it was. Yeah. J, you're you're talking JV and varsity yeah. each have their own. Right. Because they're playing at different times. Sometimes one's home, one is away. Or the varsity, like, you know, for example, when field hockey goes to Fruit Street, varsity's playing first, and then they leave, and then JV's there. So if they were to share one, then um, they're not always together at the same time. Okay. The second question is uh, regarding the, the skiing and the ski team. Mm -hmm. So I call from last year that was totally self-funded by the, the participants. Correct. So with the exception of the coaching, is that still the same policy? That's actually part of it, too. So at this point, because Alpine Ski is in its second year of the pilot, the way that um, we have that program, any pilot program running, it's a two-year self-funded. Um, so their user fee is actually a little bit higher. It's $200, and that's contributing towards all of their, everything they do, essentially. And we were fortunate last year in that the number of participants exceeded the cost of the program, um, which was a nice, a nice thing and will probably be the same this year as well. And it also ends up covering the cost of the coach in those user fees. So when you're adding the cost of the coaches in the budget, it is covered by the sport and the fees? Is that what you're saying? Essentially. So that, so next year, um, it's it's still going to – I mean, if we were at 110, for example, right now, Ski's paying 200. If we didn't increase the user fees and we stayed at 110 – it might not cover all the costs of the ski program, if that makes sense. So, so this has been a two-year pilot a two program? Year, yeah. And so this is year two, so we're, abs we're absorbing but it into the varsity budget. program, so they'll pay the same user fee that any other athlete will. Right. So F FY18 is year two. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. So we set this up as a right. policy a couple of years ago, actually, I think around the Alpine ski team, that yep. we would set parameters for a pilot to be able to gauge interest and participation, and clearly this is one that has been – successful okay. those are my questions all right great anybody think of anything else Should you did um so a lot of times out of these we sort of i don't know how we want to do this we kind of talk about revisions or right. i mean do we want to do we want to look at a budget that includes a fee increase um so well I, what is what is the appetite for so we we could say absolutely not. We're not including. We're not in, in um, increasing fees. We could say two hundred dollars seems reasonable, or we could say let's take that up an increment somewhere between one hundred and ten and two hundred, and see what would that do, especially if in combination we took out the AEDs and see what would how would that math all shake out. Um, so I don't know what the comfort level is around the table if we can have a couple of options like that how the numbers would look uh, to what you were saying Jean that a partial increase and then a full increase I don't know how much work that is for you and likewise on the event staff fees and some of the other aspects if we did rather than a 50% increase can we do a 25% increase and how would that look and maybe if we were going to do that because what I'm also hearing is that it's low across it, you know, in comparison to other districts, and it sounds like it's increasingly challenging to find that staff. Um, so I think my suggestion in that regard is if if we are not able to get where it sounds like we need to go in one year, if we were to make a plan to do that over a two-year period or whatever, so that at least that, that was communicated that, uh, you know, so just if we could think about that going forward and obviously we can't commit the five people that are going to be sitting here next year but if that's our intention at least we can uh, in, you know in good faith make that um, that communication so I ran out of things to say but I didn't say <coughs> go ahead so do we, can we bring the discussion of the fees back to another I'd like some time just to yeah process and think about it a little bit before we take 
the do, full vote on that. Do we want to? Um, I don't, you know, I have not heard. I suspect that people do not read our packets in the community. Come on. That is I don't know. That is it's it's not based on scientific hard scientific data, but just anecdotally, I'm concerned that parents may be completely yes, unaware that we're even yeah. talking about it. Um, so I'm wondering if we want how best to communicate that, just so parents are aware um, that we're talking about it, but without raising a great deal of panic. So you're looking at my face, which is doing this. This. Um, I'm making that face because I think it's really difficult to talk about something like this in isolation of the entire budget. Right. And to make parents aware of this one, which is actually tiny thing as we begin the budget deliberations, I think is problematic to your point about how people are not reading. If people were reading everything, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why we invite um, and really appreciate the input of appropriation and Board of Selectmen as other community, uh, as representing other people from the community. Um, I don't know how best to get at it, but I did want to add to this discussion is that you, what you had asked and what you can expect is that we'll come back after each of these discussions. We, you had asked for a running tally. Um, you know kind of where we were at the end of uh, the meeting, our last school committee meeting at around 6.8, not including um, Circuit, uh, the special education out of district um, and as we have each each discussion we'll be looking for direction from you and then we will provide you with an overview of a running tally of this is what it would look like if we reduce fees and what I heard tonight at this percent but I think for the community it would be more important at the end of all of this when we do have our public forum right. for them to see what it all looks like um, and if that makes sense to the school committee then that's what I would recommend. I could see. I, I was thinking the, the same thing. I mean, there's no, there's no good way to communicate. Hey, we're considering a ninety dollar increase to the athletic fee. With it. I mean, I can. Right. I don't know how much feedback we'd get, but I know what it would be. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't. I, so so, but I think if we can do it in sort of as we prepare for the public hearing of the budget, if we can think about that presentation, yep. to have right up front yes. sort of what are the highlights to the community That's so if we when. do end up doing that that goes in one of those first line items so that people can at least understand it and the, That's right. that it's happening and within the context, <coughs> context of the, the budget, entire at a budget time when they'll right. still have an opportunity to yep. provide commentary before we vote on it. That's right. right and I but I so I, I do think it's incumbent on us to send out a you know more than just it's our public hearing on our budget but yes. these are yep. uh, highlights of changes, highlights of changes highlights. and mm -hmm. you know this is your opportunity to come and yeah I agree absolutely and tell us so um, go mm -hmm. ahead. I, I was just going to ask my recollection could be off but was it not presented at the winter parent and athlete meeting it, the, how low our athletic fees were did I it was presented that? That's because yeah. this wasn't presented to anyone I was like uh oh like but it was it the, was the, presented yeah. how low they were yeah. in it for. You know, to, uh, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to propose an increase to school committee, but you know, it, it, they are so low, as it, you see. It did not seem to spark an outrage among any parents there that heard that. It was, right. It, it, it wasn't. I mean, I'm sure some yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have a high number of people that are needing assistance with our current fee? I I don't know the number. Okay. And what is the Excuse me. The threshold is—is is that have to do with free and reduced lunches, or how do we figure that? There is, there is a. We have a whole okay. financial assistance policy. Yes. Yeah. And I would also Great. think that when you did come up with the proposal, you put in a lot of thought—not just a comparison from other towns, but you know the overall ask and what seemed reasonable to you. Right. Absolutely. I think it will help all of you as we go through each of the departments and each of the reports to make decisions once you see the whole right. um, but getting direction from you at each of these meetings is helpful to Susan and I as we continue to make changes um, so at least we can get a sense of absolutely not you know we don't want to even think about it or come back with some proposals um, of what I heard tonight were, was a range of, of fee increases to include um, the event staff That's my right. takeaway and, I, and so, yeah, as a recap, I don't think we heard any absolutely not. We're not okay. considering this. Yeah. But we definitely heard 
a level of discomfort around yes. or just you know how can we work with yes um with being creative about moving something to a capital article what options do we have that are incremental steps um but you know i don't think we heard, i don't think we heard any I don't. I don't think I heard a single question about the staff, for example, no. staffing increases. So okay. Okay. Um, and maybe before we move on, if it's okay, um, because we did ask these questions as well, but I heard you ask it as well, Jean, around other sources. So I, I feel like the answer that you gave us was that you've exhausted that as far as your support, your parent support groups, the instruments, the those have been already for different reasons already exhausted. Yeah, the Music Association, um, they're actually, uh, last board meeting I was there, I did present another instrument because I want to do a piece, but it was, you know, $80 is what I'm asking for, and I'm actually going to ask the HPTA so I can get a second one. Okay. Um, so we are trying to spread the resources. And sometimes I ask questions that I know the answers to so that other people hear them. So okay. I, I do know that you guys do try that. I, I don't mean to imply that you didn't think of it, um, but it's important that we make sure the public knows how far under every rock that we're looking so sometimes there has however just been released um, it, the trustees of the schools also have a grant that they've just um, released um, that there's money there mm -hmm. and shared the information with all of the principals so I think that that's another thing to think about in terms of maybe the instruments come to mind Craig mm -hmm. um, as a one-time item okay. um, or something specific when you talked about the trifolds mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So Evan and Alan would have that information um, if you wanted to apply for a grant with the trustees of the schools. Um, they've been also a fabulous support. I think it's around $7,000. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. All right, so are we ready to move on? Now we from, are. Okay, right. but how, having said that, how about if we move up your other agenda item? Yeah. Is that okay with the, the other budget people? Yeah. The unified Just so you don't oh, have to stay. yes. Okay. The right. Unless you want yes. to stay. No, that's that on our agenda lovely. for like 11.30. Thank you. <laughs> but Craig and Colleen, we'll unless you're, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for hanging thank you. Okay, so what, for record keeping purposes, we're just moving forward a um, new business item C, the unified track and field proposal. So if you want to go ahead. Sure. So, um, sort of jumping to a, to a different topic here. Um, one of the programs that I've been exploring a little bit in theory um, has been a unified program here at the high school. Um, and basically, there are two unified programs that run throughout the state. One is basketball and one is track and field. And basically, um, what a unified team is designed to do is um, to provide a competitive sports program for students with and without intellectual disabilities. So basically, if we were to adopt a unified track and field program, um, what we would do is we would partner with our life skills program here at the high school and our best buddies program. And basically what you have is that you have students, again, with and without intellectual disabilities that will register for the unified team and participate together. And the cool part of it is that it's not necessarily that a student without an intellectual disability is, you know, participating in, a, in an event with a student with an intellectual disability. They're all doing it together. And certainly there's um, guidance and support in different areas, um, but it's just an opportunity for our students who might not otherwise have an opportunity to, to participate to do so in a competitive environment. And it's run just like a typical track and field program. There's um, eight events. They have shot put, long jump, javelin, 100, 400, 800 meter, and then a 4x100 and a 4x400. No real equipment purchase is needed because we already have it. There's only a couple things we would need, a safety, um, a safe javelin, and a few different things. But we pretty much have everything. In the, if we were to run it in the spring, we could use cross-country uniforms. Um, you know, there's... The practice schedule would just be incorporated with our normal track practice schedule that is already being run. Um, there's about four or five meets. Our, we have surrounding towns that are already running unified programs, Hudson, Algonquin, Marlboro, Shrewsbury. Um, so it would really be, you know, 
some a few bus costs um, in terms of officials you have members of the varsity track team officiate the meet so it's just a really nice way to promote inclusion and to have um, all our students and student athletes come together for really uh, for great reason and so it again it runs pretty much the same way so we would have our unified track participants pay, you know, register through family ID they pay a user fee to sort of get everything up and running but if it is something that you think is a good idea and that you would be willing to approve there is a grant in the first year of um, two thousand dollars to just help offset some of those costs and I feel confident especially in this year and next year if we were to see how it goes for a you know a two-year period you do have a three-year commitment but from a budget planning standpoint um, it, it costs about three to five thousand dollars to run and I feel confident that in this trial period that I can find ways to, to run this program without adding it into our operational budget through other sources of funding um, and I just think that we have such an incredibly successful athletic program here because of the student athletes and coaches we also have such a an active best buddies program and amazing life skills program and it's just an opportunity I know one of the struggles is thinking about the after school activities sometimes and just the mm -hmm. options and what might interest our students in that program and so I think this would just provide another option and um, myself Caitlin Burke and Chip Collins who runs Best Buddies and Caitlin Burke who um, is working in life skills all met with a representative from Special Olympics just to talk about logistically how it would go and everyone was on board and really felt like you know pending school committee interest and approval that it was something that we could make happen this year um, and they felt confident with that too in terms of knowing how the startup works so um, I think it would be a really great opportunity the, the I think the interest is there um, and I just feel like it would be a really nice addition to something special that we have here and an opportunity for our, our current student athletes to also get excited about something for our entire student population so that is the general overview um, and I don't know if anyone has any other specific questions on it or just general interest questions I wanted to make a comment if that's okay. I, I am really, really excited that you brought this forward. I have heard tremendous things. For, I, I actually worked on a separate project last year with somebody from Special Olympics who talked a little bit about the unified. It, oh, great. And I think it makes a strong statement to our athletes to and, and to the district that this is important to us. So I, I just want to say thank you for bringing oh, it forward. Thank you. Thanks for your support on it. Well, and I love that this is open to our 18 to 22 population, which yep. I think is probably the only thing. I, I'm looking at Dr. Zaleski, but like this just seems like such an incredible addition for those kids in particular. Um, I, it just the spirit of this, I just, I love this. I had no idea that this program was available, and I would just be so proud to add Hopkinton's name to the list of schools few as they are that that is participating in this I think um, it just sends such a strong message to the whole entire community um, my one question is mm -hmm. we do have our two-year pilot does this fall within that because I know this is a three-year commitment is that a challenge for any reason that we need to it feels a little different, okay. Um, just based on the way it's reported versus you know the other one kind of look seeking whether or not there's interest. But it might be wise uh, if you if you do determine a motion to make it a two year proposal. But this is one of the big differences. You said this was grant funded in the first year, right? Yeah. So if the pilot programs are specifically self funded, self funded, right? Yeah. So I don't think uh, it so. Fits it's outside into of that. I think, it, I, I think that puts it outside of it. Yeah. Okay. And we're, it's the only unified program. I would be uncomfortable starting it differently yep. than our other athletic programs. True. So very, very, very exciting um, that you have come forward with this, uh, that you collaborated with other folks in the district and did all the research that you did. Um, what is the source of the grant? Special Olympics. And would it start this year? Or would it, it would start this spring? It could, yep. So pending approval, it, um, they 
they, you know, when we met with the representative from Special Olympics, she obviously knew that this is an idea that would need to go to school committee. She's very well aware of, of the school process in that. So um, I said, you know, let me put something together, gauge interest, um, and get back to you. And so she said that, you know, if we let her know, um, I think the application is due December 1st, but she said if I had a general sense um, that they could potentially build us in you know, depending on where everyone stood on it. You clearly got support at this table. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Did you say that you already have a coach identified? Okay. So do, does that mean that we're ready to make a motion? I, I would move to approve the unified track and field proposal as presented. Seconds. As presented works. Yeah. As presented. Okay. So um, that was a motion by Mr. Graziano. I wasn't listening. A second by Ms. Gavanaugh. Um, all in favor? Yes. yes. Yes, and that is unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank you much. So much. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. I think we're going to have a lot of excited people. We're so excited. You, very that excited. I have one condition, which is that I would like to be invited to the meet. You got it. I would like to know when they are. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Very Seriously, exciting. Though, I, I would love if you sent us an invitation. I to, absolutely or just will. Not a fancy invitation, but just a last call. <laughs> you got it. I can do a little. I can fancy. Email is fine. The only invitations I have right now are like Elmo ones. If you, uh, want. If you want to drop <laughs> me there in the golf <laughs> cart, that might add a little extra. But we already said yes. So. Um, well, I'm here. Can I really quickly run down the schedule for this weekend yes, for anyone please. who may be interested? It is an exciting weekend. Really quickly, it's a very exciting weekend. Um, so. Um, before really quickly going into that, I just want to thank you all so much for your support. I know that in years one and two, I've had a lot of asks, and um, I appreciate the questions and the thoughtful process that you all go through in your general budget, which is so much work and specific to athletics. And I just, I feel so very supported, and I know that our athletic department as a whole does. So really want to thank you for all the time and effort and work. And outward support that that you all give to our programs i see all of you everywhere so it's just it's really nice and sincerely appreciated so um as we talk about um our fall which has been just awesome i don't want to say too much because i'm hoping at some point and we can have a recognition for some of our student athletes so i want to have them have the opportunity to do that but just this weekend um our volleyball team is playing in the state championship and what's really exciting about that is last year they were the division two state champions they moved to division one this year and they're oh. in the state championship again which just speaks to the strength of that program and they are a special special group of girls who work so hard and they're so fun to watch so they are playing at 5 30 at worcester state on saturday against newton north um, and then our football team is has advanced to the state semifinals. Such a huge deal. They were in last place last year in the league, finished last, and went this year um, still undefeated. Um, our coach of the year, we had the MVP of the league, both offense and defense. Um, on our and again I'm just gonna I'm gonna save a little bit of that so that when they come at some point they can share that with you but it's the farthest they've gone in a long time and it's just <clears throat> this success in general has generated a buzz um, in the in the school community I think which is great and then lastly we have um, our girls cross country team has qualified for all states and they'll be running this weekend at one o'clock in Rentham and then one of our boys qualified as an individual Alex Brown and so he'll be running this weekend in Rentham at 11:40. Um, so just wanted to take a moment to share that um, the football team plays in Weymouth at two so it's Weymouth to Worcester so <laughs> logging some miles on the car but for all good reason so hoping to get a lot of fan support for for our student athletes who have had a very long season but that means a good one yeah. since they're playing so so deep into it so just wanted to share that with everyone and you know it's a lot far but if anyone's able to come i'd love to see you there all that deserves applause so, I yeah, yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much and congratulations thanks. oh Elizabeth. thanks <clears throat> thanks for letting me take up so much of your time i know you have a long night so no well thank you very <laughs> much and you're welcome to stay for the rest of it <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. There's a really good Celtics Warriors game on right now. Uh, uh, <laughs> and we did have going to relieve the babysitter. Uh, I That's know. what I thought you were going to say. Well, we did also have one last thing I'll say is that we had um, a leadership training today for our captains and student athletes, and it was um, from the Positive Coaching Alliance. And the trainer who came to train our um, leaders 
actually was then leaving to drive into Boston to have a moderated conversation with Brad Stevens, the coach of the Celtics, and Steve Kerr, the coach of the Warriors. So he was awesome. And it was a really cool, cool thing. So it's kind of, the kids were all excited. They're like, oh, he's going to go work with the Celtics right after us. So it was fun. (laughs) Anyway, just thought I'd share that. Thank you all so much. Thank 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 you. All right, should we, what would you like to start with or go back to now? Uh, we'll, we'll end with central Entra- office. End with so central you can office. Go wherever you um, like we're playing Jeopardy. I know. I know. <laughs> like draw one out of a yes. hat. Yes. Um, <laughs> Why don't you go alphabetically? Um, alphabetically? Yeah, okay. Oh, you're right. really challenging. All right. Um, buildings and grounds. There you that go. Would be, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's really late this for me. Okay. okay. So, um, Mr. Person, thank you. Everybody was hoping to get called. I know. You are the lucky, lucky winner. Mr. Person commented to me after the last meeting that we went easy on it. <laughs> oh, so now, uh, now we're going to go check. That was a private conversation. <laughs> I've been prepping for this now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. About I'm hoping I get applause at the end of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so we'll start off with you know just kind of quick uh, budget overview for, um, for the buildings and grounds department. Uh, preliminary FY19 buildings and grounds. Um, we have an increase of 196 thousand. $935, or about 6.8%. The increase consists of $80,000 in salary, which includes an additional custodian for the new Marathon <coughs> School, and a point four facilities use position, and plus the regular salary increases. The increase in expenses of $132,000 consists mostly of the increase to utilities that are related with the Marathon School as well. So I'll go through our extraordinary maintenance uh, projects, and then um, you know, let's see where we go. So at the Elmwood School, it's really light this year. Um, we have a $2,000 uh, window replacement project. So in the past, we had put in a conference room. I think it's their main conference room. Um, we put an air conditioning unit in a window, and when we did that, we took out the ability to bring in any uh, outside air. So what we'd like to do is just you know, take the next window over, be able to make that a functioning window. It's a solid, solid window today. So the goal is to get that just to be able to slide open like a normal window <coughs> so they can, um, you know, utilize some fresh air in the, in the you know, cooler, uh, cooler weather. Plus, when the AC is running in the room, um, it can be a little disturbing to any meetings that are going on. So uh, Hopkins, Hopkins has, a, uh, you know, a little more in here. Um, the first one is the gym partition wall. So after a year, the gym partition wall separates the cafeteria and the gymnasium. And after years of opening and closing that, the track gets worn out. The walls themselves from, you know, balls getting, you know, thrown against them and, and kids, you know, leaning on them, kicking them and, you know, so, so on and so forth. They get worn out. Um, it's starting to become an issue where um, we have one guy that's really the expert at opening them. And so we let him do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So, um, you know, our fear is that, you know, one day they could come off the tracks, those are pretty big walls, and, and you know, have the potential of falling, you know. Um, in place, they're fine. So it's not a safety concern today. In place, they're not going to fall over. They're not, in, you know, there's no fear of any injury today. I think it's just opening and closing, and that could cause the safety concern. Um, what was the other thing? gym petition wall, uh, drinking fountain. So um, we're looking at this as a project a couple years back. Uh, prior to me being here, they did a um, uh, lead and copper test on the, on the bubblers. Some of those came back uh, positive. So we're, uh, we're going to reopen that you know, case study we closed. They closed down the bubbler, so they're not in use today. We'd like to get those back up and running. Um, so we threw, you know, we threw a a number at that to um, either replace the bubblers or help replace some of the plumbing. Um, we will go back through and do water testing again. Um, Pankton classroom. So you know Elmwood's you know got a little age on it now. Uh, we'd like to 
get started on a program to paint classes, kind of catch up, and then my team will then kind of take that project over going forward. Um, but just to kind of get us at a starting point, you know, we'd like to have um, we'd like to have that started. Um, sorry about this. Uh, The fence surrounding the outside, I apologize, the fence surrounding the outside basketball courts. So um, there's, a, there's a fence that surrounds the basketball courts. We built a ramp at some point from the basketball courts to the playground. And on that ramp, they have um, railings that go all the way up. And so what the kids are doing is they're coming through between the ramp um, handle and the fence, and that's worn out. It's starting to wear out that and uh, just regular erosion from rainwater is wearing out the the ground between you know between the fence and the and the ramp. So what we'd like to do we want to repair that, but we'd like to put an opening down at the end of the fence area so the kids can come right from the building. I know I'm making these hand motions that mean nothing. Come right <laughs> from the building and into the the playground without them having to try to side skirt that ramp area. Um, we did have an injury there last year. Did we have it? Yeah, I didn't and, know that. Um, I know that there's been ongoing repairs mm -hmm. to the area, and then, as you say, it just keeps washing out. So more of yeah. a permanent fix is definitely needed. Yeah, and area. I think yeah. So I think that's something we can kind of handle in house. We'll we'll grade out that. We'll put some rock in, yeah. put some drainage in to be able to kind of take care of the erosion issues. But a, really, a gate at the other end or an opening right. in the fence at the other end would help. Um, and then hand dryers. We. Um, you know, this is a project we think we'd like to start instituting in, in the schools, but kind of give it a, a bit of a trial run down at, down at um, Hopkins School. Um, hand dryers, you guys have seen them in bathrooms. Um, the installation of those will take away the, the need for paper towels, um, which helps reduce waste and, you know, kind of uh, additional cost. We really think it'll help during our basketball programs and stuff on the weekends where we're, where we're noticing increased usage of paper towels. Uh, middle school. So the middle school, um, right outside the middle school at the water tower where parents do drop off, right at the beginning of drop off, there is a, uh, it's created a little gully there. Um, so what happens in the winter time and in, in the summertime when it rains, that puddles over in the winter time it freezes. Um, you know, we, we throw sand and salt out there to, you know, you know, make it so it doesn't, but nobody pulls up. We lose a couple of car lengths in drop off, which you know, creates a traffic problem, you know, going into the street. Um, so we'd like to just kind of dig that out, repack the ground, repave it so that that dip in the in the pavement goes away. Um, the flooring in the hallways, so if you go up, I think they st it looked to me like they started the flooring replacement. If you come in from the, the gym section, we'd like to kind of continue on. If you go up into the hallways, there is uh, cracking. Cracking of tile, you know, so we'd like to just kind of remove that and, and start, you know, flash the floor so it's level and then retile uh, with VCT. Um, and then again, we'd like to start painting classrooms. I think it's been a long time at the middle school. It's starting to show its age. Um, so we'd like to start painting the classrooms, get a jump over it, on it over the summertime, and then again, continue on with the maintenance staff through uh, break weeks and, and you know, summer projects going forward. <clears throat> High school, uh, the big one on here would be um, the athletic center floor. I think this has come come up in the past um, with Al. So uh, if you haven't been to the athletic center in a while, the floor itself is, um, is starting to get a little, little worn out. The lines are starting to fade. And the logo is, um, I guess, a previous logo. So um, we'd really like to strip it down, redo the lines, put the put the new logo in, and then refinish the floor over. Um, carpet in the guidance area, this would be an extension of what we did for a project this past summer. So we stopped at the main office. Um, we just want to continue that hallway and into guidance and, and finish that area. Carpets in there, if you haven't been in there, are getting uh, stained and starting to tear up and, you know, just in regular need of replacement. Um, and then uh, the engineering for the wetlands delineation. Um, this was from the 1996 turf field projects. Um, I know we've talked about it in, in other meetings. Um, so just to kind of get the engineering rolling on that so we can, you know, understand what the cost will be going forward to uh, replace, the, um, re 
replace, uh, replicate the wetlands from 1996. <coughs> Personnel summary, um, as I stated, we're looking for a custodian at the Marathon School. So the Marathon School size has increased from 50,000 square feet to 80,000 square feet. I think in order to, to uh, maintain a level of cleanliness that we think we're going to need or want going forward, that uh, an additional person, full-time person there, is going to be much needed. Um, the secondary person is a four, .4 uh, part-time position for facilities use. So in the past, we had a, a part-time facilities use person who would you know, um, put together you know, these events, the basketball leagues, and so on and so forth. We had, um, we had downsized that position um, and ha asked um, uh, my, my admin and Dee's admin has kind of combined and then taken on that position as well. So she's really running a position and a half right now. And in the, um, you know, in the busy season, like right now is really busy with, uh, you know, with the league basketball going on. Um, it gets to be kind of overwhelming, you know, so we think another, you know, a, a point four position would help us, you know, alleviate some of that pressure and um, better organize how we're, how we're bringing in our facilities use. If I may, Tim, this sure. was a reduction that was recommended in a previous budget, and we've now since had changes in both administrators in both of those departments. Um, partly we wanted to evaluate you know, efficiencies and to see where, how we were doing. Um, so we did make that initial reduction. Um, and now that we have two different administrators in place, um, we feel confident with the recommendation that they are certainly utilizing their current um, uh, secretarial position mm -hmm. <laughs> to... <laughs> oh, maybe above capacity. Above and beyond. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, she's wonderful. She's she's balancing both, but it, right. it, it definitely is something that we want you to know that we've been evaluating and mm -hmm. put in initially as a reduction, and it, and now, um, having done that, are seeking to to return it, not even to where it was. Um, I still think it. You're asking for a point four increase. Yes. So I I still think that that's below. I think it was one point six in total. Mm -hmm. um, but that you'll recall that that reduction happened a couple of budgets ago. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and, and, you know, to Kathy's point, you know, uh, the admin that does that is she really is fantastic. She goes above and beyond to help us, both D and I. She's really kind of the linchpin that connects D and I, especially during the, you know, outdoor athletic season. You know, when D and I can't connect on things, Lou is really right in the middle of that and, um, and helps us align, which has been fantastic, you know, and I, I hope it showed this year, so. Um, but there's something about school dude I think that it's worthy of also mentioning, Tim, just if you it, would. The great point, yeah. So school dude, um, if you don't know, is a program that we use for um, our facilities use, our maintenance direct, and we're instituting our PM direct through it, so uh, preventative maintenance. Um, facilities use is um, it's, it's a key thing for all the schools. They, they really run, they run through Lou, who puts you know, all these requests into the system. And what it does, um, a small piece of what it does is it helps us not double book rooms, not double book fields, not, um, and it keeps track of, of who we, you know, who we've used in the past, who we're using in the, in the future for, you know, these types of uh, events. Um, and Lou, Lou's done a great job managing it. It's a great tool to have, and I think we're right scratching the surface of, and, and Susan could probably help explain School Dude better. She's... She's been my go-to person from her past experience, um, but it's really been a great, um, a great tool for many reasons. Facilities use, maintenance direct. We do all our work orders through there, and then also our PM direct, which will, which we're starting to institute now. We're going to take all of our building equipment, all of our vehicles, all of our you know lawn care equipment, and that'll all go into this program. We'll be able to track the maintenance on it, track the usage. Um, understand better when replacement will happen. So, um, yeah, school dude in general is just, it really um, is a great program that, uh, you know, we're going to hopefully utilize more as a tool going forward. Yeah. The name makes it sound cool. And it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It was a very yeah. interesting name. <laughs> but we need someone to do the inputting of all that, that, data, yeah, that so, great data. And, and that is, that's a, that's a big part of it. As we're collecting the data, um, 
um, we could we could use this point four position to help us kind of input that and track as we go forward. You know, um, you know, track vehicle use, taking equipment out that we're discarding and putting new equipment in. Mm -hmm. You know, so it really is. Um, it really is a, a key position in order, I think, in keeping us organized, um, both budget-wise and, you know, use-wise. So then I'll just go through the expense summary. Uh, expense summary uh, for FY19 utilities has been increased by 105,000. That's reflective of the Marathon School as well. Um, again, another it's a 30,000 square foot increase in building. Um, And then the uh, uh, remaining increase was um, the actuals for Hopkins School. So Hopkins School um, electricity has increased. Um, I don't know if you. Yeah, so the, the Hopkins School, um, if I look, at, it seemed like the end of fiscal year 16, the Hopkins School electric um, account has jumped. And so through fiscal year 17, uh, Hopkins was running higher than budgeted and higher than previous years. Um, so we've increased the budget to account for that. The, the, the good side is Hopkins School has been the focus of the green energy or green communities grant mm -hmm. this year. So the hope is in some of the work that we're doing with that green communities and one is the energy management system. Mm -hmm that we can get at some of these units that potentially, um, as Tim found, some are fighting each other. They're heating and cooling at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, exhaust fans are running 24-7. So things like that, as, as Tim gets further into it and with uh, that Green Community mm -hmm. Grant, hopefully we can bring this back down. But for now, we've budgeted for that increase until we get a handle on what's going on, particularly in that building. All right. So we're in the we're just um, we just finished up the lighting portion of that project. So um, um, we did a lot of uh, changeover from uh, T8 uh, ballasts and, and light bulbs to um, to LEDs. So it's been a it's been a great package kind of going in. I don't know you know it might be a little bright. Amina, you're down there. Have you, I don't know if you've noticed. If you haven't, it's probably a good thing. You know it means we put a good lighting system in. Um, the VFDs are starting to get installed now. The equipment's getting installed. Um, but that process will probably take us into January, I'm guessing, until we have it really up and running and, and trained on it and, and you know, focusing the equipment into, into the goals we need them to be at. sense of why it jumped in 2016, something. Yeah, we're trying to figure that out. We, we honestly, I think we, we think it might be some of the system failures that we're having, you know, so as, um, as Sue had mentioned, um, I have one unit that we just figured out was running hot and cold air at the same time. So it was heating one side and cooling the other. Um, you know, so some of those things where, you know, we're working through the current system on, on, on fixing because we don't want hot and cold air going at the same time. And then also with the exhaust fans, you know, the kitchen hood, which is a which is a giant hood, is pulling out a lot of the heat from the building. So we're, we're figuring out why that's not shutting down at appropriate times. We have through this you know, project and working with PRISM, and um, we're looking at figuring out how to get these things on, on you know, better timers and off, off and on times. Um, in the gym, we've talked about, you know, we do a lot of league basketball on the weekends. Instead of cooling the gym through the whole time, we'll have a, a, almost a button in there that they'll be able to use. They hit the button, and the HVAC will come on for two hours. And then when they exit the gym, nobody ever thinks to shut that, you know, hit the button off. So it'll just shut itself down. The next group that comes in will be able to hit that button, or if it's the same group, they'll be able to hit that button again. So um, just kind of even small stuff like that really adds up. Um, in the long run, so you know we're hoping we're hoping this electric bill will come back into line. You know, um, the maintenance supply accounts, um, including contracted services, have been increased to reflect actuals over the past two years. Um, and we're looking at installing preventative maintenance programs, which will in, which will in, increase the cost as well. So you know. Um, you know, it's scary when you say we're going to increase the costs on preventative maintenance stuff. Um, I think the good part to that is that we're taking we're taking these things into smaller pieces. So rather than having a forty-five hundred dollar bill, the goal is to have you know figure out what's going on with this equipment prior to have it serviced and then 
and then we're not getting to the big catastrophic failure. So that's, uh, that's really the goal of any preventative maintenance is you spend a little bit up front to hopefully, you know, save a lot in the end. Sometimes these things can fail anyway. You know, it's, it's mechanical. That stuff happens. But I think having a better handle on it will stop a lot of, you know, crises that happen, you know, um, a boiler going down over a weekend or, you know, so on and so forth. So um, having a good preventative maintenance program will help us to stay ahead of it rather than always, you know, try and attack it from the backside. Um, and then um, also, you know, looking at the grounds equipment and the vehicles, they're starting to have a little bit of age on them. Um, so we, we tried to pull those costs back up into actuals um, as well. You know, so uh, the vehicles don't have a lot of miles on them because they're really only driven in the school grounds, but the miles that they have on them are tough. So, um, you know, we're going to start evaluating the vehicle programs as well and how to better um, either figure out how to replace them so we're not um, putting a lot of maintenance costs into them or or making sure we're, we have the right maintenance program going. Again, School Dude will help us with that as well. Um, and then the custodial supply uh, account has been increased um, to actual spend. Um, and that's, so the, uh, the additional square footage, again, in the Marathon School is going to, uh, you know, cause some increased costs in cleaning. There are... Uh, probably twice as many bathrooms, I think, in this new school that, than there are in the center school. Every kindergarten and pre-K classroom has a restroom in it now, which is, uh, you know, a big change from what we have. Uh, the good part is, is that when they did the design on this, we do have um, hand dryers in a lot of these bathrooms uh, already, so it's, a, you know, it's another program that we won't have to try to kind of back into. Um, there is also a sink in every classroom that will require a paper towel holder. So, so some of the costs at 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 the from center to marathon will stay the same, but some have increased just due to sheer size of the building. Um, and then just the revolving, you know, the use of our revolving and parking lot revolving accounts have been used to offset the budget at level and reflects the income revenue. You know, and that's, you know, our goal there is to sustain, you know, that, you know, that at a level field so we're not, you know, depleting it too much in one year and there'll be, you know, money for us to use as needed. So that's it in a nutshell. John, I'm ready for your question. <laughs> <laughs> Kick us off. I, I actually, I, the only questions I have relate to the offsets. So, I mean, everything that you pr proposed in there makes sense, but I'm just noticing that the offsets are really variable off of our previous years. So, I don't know if this is a, a um, Susan, question. Are we trying to level that? I mean, I, I noticed we've had no discernible pattern in our offsets in, in previous years for these, for the parking and, and building use accounts. There is, and that's correct. Um, so I think what would happen is you would have an offset of, say it was 100000 but then yep. all these other things would come about and it would be taken out of the That's revolving. what I was going to say. It feels yeah. like we, it's not, decision, like it's not a decision we made at, at budget time necessarily. Right. It's a decision that it's what's a boiler your went actual. in. It's the yeah, well we in, go to. Yeah, so, yes. okay. so, so it's difficult. So we're not necessarily – increasing the allocation that we're having to those offsets we're just trying to tie it closer to revenue so so would this not no longer be sources for extraordinary like emergency extraordinary maintenance if we do that well you're trying to so you you have a balance in that account yeah so if you are appropriating based on your revenue then if you have an extraordinary event, you can use that. We can use the balance, balance. but we're going to run it. We're going to try to run it net zero, basically. You're going to try to run it net zero. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm good. I, I have a few questions. Um, on the Elmwood um, mm -hmm. extraordinary maintenance, mm -hmm. the projection is $2,000. And, and we know that, you know, we've been talking about a new school. Mm -hmm. And based on what I have seen, it could certainly use a facelift. Mm -hmm. um, so why is it so much lower? Well, I think, um, um, I don't know, maybe Kathy could help me out. I don't, you know. Um, right. Because 
In terms of the, the very reason that you just raised, Mina, which is if we are going to be within the next five years looking at a replacement, um, we want to be able to maintain the building, of course, in terms of any, any kinds of structural um, requirements, um, but to minimize what we're putting in if we can avoid. And at the Elmwood School over the past several years, the program that Tim is describing for the Hopkins School and the, and the middle school around painting and carpeting has been in place. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we've been ignoring the school structurally in terms of windows and the kinds of things that we want to make sure that maintain the building and keep it safe for kids um, are absolutely will continue to be maintained. But if there's something like a good example that comes to mind that had been on the budget had been the, um, the curtain on the stage. That's not something that we're going to do and give a facelift to if we're going to be looking at potentially a, a building replacement. And if once we get invited into the MSBA, yeah, um, what is it called? Their lineup? No, it's not Process. their lineup. SOI. Yeah. Um, once we get invited in, depending on what it, we end up finding out, we're going to need to do. Then, then we're in a place where we can make decisions about repairs. Pipeline. Um, pipeline. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, that's why it wasn't right there. <laughs> so does that make sense? It's not like we're it's not like we're ignoring the building, and we're yeah. certainly doing the things that need to be done. But if there are things that can wait, um, we're going to want to wait until we evaluate the replacement. <clears throat> I mean, again, you know, that was the thought process. We don't know yet, right? And so, looking at some of the other areas, and I'm just wondering, as I recall from last year's conversation when the proposal was coming up for the need for the new school. Uh, that there were some issues with the gymnasium and whatnot. Yes. Um, so I would expect to see some uh, suggestions around that for yeah. improvement. So you'll see, for example, that another really great example is the, um, the wall, the movable wall that Tim was describing at the Hopkins School. Similarly, there's one at the Elmwood School that had been on the budget. I think it was $100,000, and I think we talked about it several years in a row. Um, and it had been on this year's as well. Mm -hmm. But when in making decisions about what we can wait on and what has to happen right away, these are the kinds of, you know, if everything was on, then we would be coming to you with, with a, a, an increase that would be completely, you know, unacceptable. So those are the kinds of comparisons where we think, well, we might have to wait on this another year or two while we determine whether spending that kind of money right now makes sense. And we've made significant investments in Elmwood <coughs> extraordinary maintenance wise in the past couple of years, if I recall. We absolutely have with okay. the roof, um, with the I think the boilers. The boiler, yeah, I think but the definitely yeah. boilers, roof, carpet. Yep. I know we did carpeting this past year. Right. Um, okay. And uh, in, in in the capital, we put for some HVAC HVAC improvements through That's all the right. buildings. You know, so it's not you know, so there won't be you know. Some of some of the money's just coming out of a different bucket, but will service the Elmwood School as well. As far as mechanically and making sure that you know everything's running correctly, we did a, a big UV project to, over this summer too. I think yep, we went we through about 20 of the UVs that heat and cool the classrooms or bring fresh air into the classroom. So Elmwood was one of our more expensive dual entry system um, as yeah. part of the uh, dual entry safety measures. Um, we had to actually do it twice. So we, we did that as well. Um, right. Can I ask just a, a follow-up that I think kind of bridges between the two of you? So if we do get invited in by the MSBA and to do a feasibility study, it also could be determined, I'm assuming, that we would renovate the building or put an addition on they it. They will determine, yeah. And in which case, some of those costs, the things that we might want to do, would be offset by the MSBA. Correct. So would it not make sense to put them off from that exactly. standpoint? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Offset or replace oh, completely. Mm -hmm. There, I don't remember where it was in here, but the um, center school, you can see the numbers go down and yeah. eventually work their way to zero mm -hmm. as the new school was approved. And, yeah. and so I think that's probably, I'm guessing, yeah. why that. Yeah, if you look at the, the extraordinary case. maintenance history line item, the, is that where it is? That kind of cascading yeah. downward. Yeah. Um, another question I have for you. Um, is on the hand dryers. Mm -hmm. um, is there any kind of a study, and I didn't do the research on it, is if you just had the hand dryers versus the option of having the hand dryers and the paper towels, um, and, and I don't know what the proposal is. Is the proposal to do away with the hand towels completely? 
I think that would be the ultimate goal is to do away with them. Um, I, I don't know that there's been a study done, and uh, I, I haven't looked. I can look. Um, I don't know that there's been a study done, but um, I think it's just going on. Um, I think what a lot of uh, you know green communities are doing are they're going away from these you know kind of disposables, you know landfill items, you know potential to um, you know hand dry system. Yeah, and actually, there 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 are studies out okay. there. That, <laughs> yeah, um, the sense. hand dry, having the hand dryers versus the paper towels and the cost of cleaning and you know because it takes custodians into the bathroom, more trash. So mm -hmm. having the hand dryers is less expensive. Um, so you, I mean, you start to see that in many places, universities, there's no paper towels. You know, they've taken all that away. Everything is hand dryers. I would wonder too on the weekends if we see an increase of kids that are playing with paper towels and yeah, and they end up in the toilet. I was going to say, and then you know you flush a bunch sure. down a urinal, and now oh, you, now you're snaking thing. out the urine. You know, so it's yeah, there's some there's some side costs that probably aren't, I don't know if they're factored into these <laughs> things when they're doing the these study? studies. But, <laughs> so, but <laughs> is this uh, your proposal? Is it right now to do both for a while and then do away with the paper towels? I think if we um, if we start the program, we will do away with the paper towels in the in the restrooms that we choose. So I think what okay. Susan and I had kind of talked about was starting really around the gyms and um, and common use bathrooms and gang bathrooms. Um, yeah. What is a gang bathroom? We got to use a better I, word I, for I that. <laughs> when I saw that, we're more, more than one stall. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It didn't sound <laughs> know, a terrible word. Sounds yeah, very prison like. It's not, I didn't it's mean not to. Multi stall or size. That jumped out at me too. <laughs> so that would be that would be the goal. Would be to remove the paper towels in those areas um, completely. A uh, couple more questions on the expense summary, um, you know, item number four that you have, and the increase because of marathon. Mm -hmm. So would this be the new baseline? Y yes. Well, I mean, uh, projected for, ut for utilities. That's right. Projected yes. baseline. Right? So these are these are the utility projections from the engineering studies. So that's the new baseline until we start getting some actuals. Um, and the last question I have is on the personnel, and it's not just restricted to, uh, you know, the buildings and grounds, mm -hmm. but overall, when we hire someone, how does that salary projection look over the years and onto the retirement benefits? Um, do we have anything around that that we could, you know, salary just scales? You mean? Um, I, I won't just think of it as scale. So let's say we hire a person this year and it costs us, um, say, $30,000. Mm -hmm. How do we see that number increase, uh, you know, some projections around it mm -hmm. based on the role of that personnel? Um, you know, whether if it's teachers, you would have the lane changes projections. Yeah. And down to the retirement. And the reason why I ask this is whenever we are hiring, yeah. obviously, you know, again, you're raising your baseline. Yeah. And then over the years, all the benefits that... Um, we would have to take care of. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm wondering if there is anything around it that's available. So it's it's driven by a couple of things, right? The first would be the, the agreements. What, so the custodial agreement, it would all be spelt out there in terms of um, salary projection. But then there's also an assumption around benefits that, you know, is not always accurate because not every person that we hire avails themselves of benefits Right. So and and so it's a very complex question. Um, Jean looks like she wants well, to jump in. Well, just to add on, because we just had this conversation at, the, at our budget advisory mm -hmm. group meeting on Tuesday. Tuesday was that? Was that it? Tuesday. Wow. Really? Okay. Um, because the benefits are actually carried in the town budget, not the school budget, um, and so our town, like. Every other town has a significant OPEB liability. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. Um, so that is something that the town has been planning for and contributing to um, over the course of the last several <coughs> years, five years. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, by no means are we caught up, but neither is any other town. So it's something that, I mean, to your point, we always do ask, you know, is this a full time? Um, position that comes with benefits and you know we have so many point whatevers <coughs> not 
whatever is our total FTE doesn't mean a total number of, it's not the same as a total number of people. So we are aware of that because even though it doesn't come out of the school budget directly, it's obviously a big liability that the town has been facing and, um, and been wrestling with. So, but on the other hand, we have no other choice other than to hire a municipal employee. So, um, you know, that's, that's a consideration that comes with every staff that we add in to the budget unless they're part time. So. There's also a recommendation, Mina, that we follow in this regard that has to do with square footage and how much mm -hmm. space is we're cleaning. Um, and we've been really behind in this area um, and have been slowly building it up over the past three years. Uh, this was an area that historically really was, was lacking. Um, and our building showed, it showed as a result. And so we feel good about the fact that we're getting where we need to be. I believe that this addition, um, Tim, correct me, Sue, if I'm wrong, but I think it it would put it would be a requirement in order for us to stay um, within within what the recommendations but it puts us in a good place and initially um, we have been looking at two positions within this budget one for maintenance and one for custodial um, and and through our many discussions um, determined that for this year that there would be only the custodial position that would be requ requested yeah. um, so is that accurate around the no, square yeah, footage? That, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I believe it is, yeah, accurate. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I just want to make sure we are hard enough on him this time. I don't want to <laughs> be spreading the word that we went too easy. I'm, I'm not leaving until I get my applause. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, do have, I do have a question. You have to play an instrument first. <laughs> I do have a question, and then I just also have a comment. Sure. So I'm going to say my comment first, which I think, you know, this entire – presentation is really indicative of the promise that you both made to us about taking a much deeper dive um, and really slowly, I mean, Susan's promising to read manuals of boilers and whatnot. <laughs> um, but it just, you know, as you were talking, struck me that, that that is what you're doing. You're going down to a very deep level um, and, you know, trying to get us on a more sustainable course uh, that has fewer peaks and valleys going forward is that's my big picture takeaway from this conversation and I think that I was also feel I feel like I also was hearing that in the you know athletic department presentation as well trying to sort of do some correction that will be a little mm -hmm. bit less um, dramatic going forward but that will put us on a more predictable um, path and yes. is that a fair assessment <coughs> okay so I just want to say thank you for doing what you said you were going to do um, <laughs> I wish that the news was we found thousands and millions of dollars that we don't that need to chest. spend but but I mean you're doing what what you promised and what we asked you to do so thank you um, and my one suggestion is I believe and this was a long time ago and probably Rebecca is the only other person that's going to remember this um, I am pretty sure that the Basketball Association paid to refinish the floor in the Brown Gym the last they, time that we did that. And they still do. That. They do it every year. No, but when we had to redo it. Oh, Not oh, like redo, the annual, redo. but if oh. we're looking at the big one um, mm -hmm. for the high school, I don't know if that's a conversation that has taken place or could take place. Because it could they, be. I think the Basketball Association has shied away from the Athletic Center here. Yeah. Um, I think they're using the other schools more. Well, they use it for their massive tournament that's yeah. about to happen. They use the middle, the middle school. They use everything they for tap-off. They use the they high school for, their, for the tap-off, but I think throughout the season Throughout they the don't season, use, that's they correct, use, but yeah. they do use yeah. it. So, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. I'm just, if that's a well, rock you haven't that. already looked under, yep. it might be I'm, I'm happy to look under it again. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, did you all have questions for Tim? Actually, I thought Tim... Is everything was very uh, details, a lot of details in there, especially why you're going to paper towels. <laughs> <laughs> Not paper towels. <laughs> so I think we're ready. Getting away from paper towels. Paper towels. <laughs> <laughs> we're ready for our round of applause. Okay. So there's a reason also that we have. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago, Tim helped us um, oh, you know, resolve yes. an issue with one of our senior citizens who had brought it up. Yes. And I met her this morning, and she was very, very appreciative of you having taken care of that extra light that yeah. was polluting her backyard. Sure. Uh, and she said it's still off, and she is <laughs> super, super happy. So she, she every night sleeping, sleeping well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm How many glad nights to hear will that. this last? And I love the darkness. <laughs> <laughs>
So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Two rounds of applause. Wow, that was great. Uh, so you can tell you D can about tell that D. tomorrow. You can brag to D tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good night, Tim. All right. So continuing the celebration, um, They're both we're going in alphabetical cake. order, which we said we were going to do. It is. Then Dr. Zaleski would be up next, unless I yep. didn't have my alphabet in the right order. Sorry, Ashok. <laughs> the chairs are comfortable, right? At least. Okay. Are you setting us up or we're just going right no, into it? No, there's no introduction okay. to Dr. Zaleski. Oh, <laughs> she, uh, needed. you know, I, I will just say as I, as I will for every report that, um, you know, we've worked really closely uh, along and Dr. Zaleski has um, worked like everybody in terms of across the district, but in her case, um, her, her budget has implications um, that are very, um, inclusive, I suppose, in each of the buildings. And any, any changes that she makes to her budget requires meeting with many, many people. So she's been back and forth probably three or four times already to bring her to tonight um, and is presenting a very thorough budget. I think um, also I'll just remind everybody um, that the school committee has had your budget um, and your overview. So I, I'm not sure you need to go through it line okay. by line. Sure. I mean the budget piece, but um, you know more of a summary. Sure. Uh, as well, I'm sure they have many questions. So thank you, Dr. Zaleski. Thank you. So I have, I've, I've put it up just so folks can take a look, um, and I know you all have so it in front easier. of you. So I'll just I'll just summarize as Dr. McLeod has indicated. Yeah. Um, so when you look at my budget, there's an increase of 10.3 percent, and that's inclusive of the tuitions. Um, so that includes both collaborative and privately placed students. Um, so students, just for folks who are watching, students um, come to the district with a variety of needs and sometimes we have mo students who've moved in that are already in placements and we need to maintain them in those placements and other times we have ne critical needs at the building level that we are analyzing and we make those determinations. So that's the result of that increase. But when you look at the budget separate of that increase, <coughs> My budget really is a 1.2 percent um, increase, and mainly that's from um, separate of the tuitions. That's from lane changes in the salaries, and and um, uh, I did make an increase to a clerical position, which I'll speak about. So uh, to that point, when you look at the personnel summary, um, the the 0 0.3 clerical increase is an increase directly in my office. We have an incredible volume of record keeping requirements and um, on a daily basis families are coming in and requesting records. We get requests from legal counsel for, for families um, and we get requests from private placements. So the, the volume of requests that we receive is quite overwhelming. Um, so to that end I've, I've found that over the past year um, you know, we've done a, a lot of work with the secretarial staff and me trying to take funds from grants and, and other ways to try and cover that. So rather than continue to do that and, and depend on the grants, I felt it was fiscally responsible to add it to the budget. Because um, we are down on one of our grants this year, a grant we typically counted on, we're not receiving at all. Uh, we got word from the uh, Department of Education on that. So when you look at um, new positions, I'm requesting to add a special education coach to the grades two to five buildings. So really the purpose of this position, so as you know, those are the two level two schools and we're looking at really trying to bridge the gap between general education and special education and how to better provide specialized instruction in, those cl in the classrooms. So just so you folks have a lens, we have tiered interventions in the instruction that we offer to students. Um, and I have team chairs in the buildings that are working directly with the special educators. But the team chairs act in the role of case management. They're managing the, the IEP team process and all the legal requirements that go with that. And then you have the special educators working in conjunction with the general educators. What I'm hoping that this position will do is provide direct, not only oversight, but intervention um, and information to learning specialists about what are the best specialized instructional strategies that we can be using in the classroom. Because the team chairs are case managing and the teachers are teaching, I feel like that's the piece that's missing. So we can really hunker down 
and, and, and take a look at tier one, two, and three and our specialized interventions and make some real good decisions research-based about what the students need at those levels. So we are offering specialized instruction, but again, I feel like if we had an expert come in and work with those two buildings, we could also pull together and streamline our, our um, strategies as well, because I think that would be very, very good um, you know, as we move forward. So in an effort to um, hopefully receive this position, um, so I'm just going to jump down in terms of reductions. I did make a recommenda recommendation to reduce a special educator at the Hopkins School. So it is somewhat of an even swap in terms of um, finances. By the reduction of that position, I would take the funds from that position to pay for the coaching position. <coughs> And we can do this reduction with ease. In analyzing caseloads and projections for, for next year, FY19, um, the, by the reduction of the special education instructor position, it would only increase caseload of the current staffing by one student. So it, it, that would not have a drastic impact. Um, there would be some, some restructuring of the, of the classes and the way that we're organizing them in terms of the inclusive in, you know, offerings and the co-teaching, but it would not impact student service delivery in the sense that there'd be a great deal of increase in class sizes for special education students at all. Um, and actually, through the elimination of that position, if we had the coach, that coach can do a, a lot of that direct work with those teachers in those specialized environments to, to help streamline our, our strategies. Um, also with the reductions, um, so I just want to highlight a few things. The, the point one district-wide paraprofessional, I've done a lot of work with the team on um, parafading to increase student independence across the district, and we've restructured the paraprofessional staffing. And um, so by way of doing that, and again, analyzing caseloads, I'm able to very comfortably reduce a position by point one. Um, and there's no ask for paraprofessionals at this point, which I feel is very good because the work that we've done to stabilize um, the students at the pre-K level, because it really starts at the pre-K level where, where we have great need, but the restructuring that we did last year with that has really helped stabilize us in the sense that, I don't know if you remember in the past years, I continually come and ask for a paraprofessional position as kids moved in and we had needs, but because of the work we did with the restructuring, we haven't had to do that, and actually now I'm able to reduce a little bit um, by point one to continue our, st our service delivery within the IEP requirements. So that's good news, um, and the students are, you know, foster, you know, fostering independence in the environments that they're in, without being overly dependent on the adults, which is the goal ultimately educationally. I'm making a recommendation to reduce a physical therapist by point two, and. Um, Again, in analyzing the student service delivery and the caseloads for actually this year and FY19, I am able to make that reduction. The reason that I'm holding off on reducing to FY19 specifically is we have a number of students. So over the summer, during the ESY program, we were very hard pressed to find a physical therapist to do work in the summer. That's really not uncommon for that type of specialty. So as a result of that, um, we're right now providing compensatory services to families to meet the need of the students who miss those services in the summer. Um, so we're using that position right now to fill not only the current service delivery, but the compensatory mm -hmm. owed to families. But as of FY19, um, we will not have that need, and so I can comfortably reduce that by 0.2. Um, this past year, Last year when I came to you folks, we had asked for a 1.0 teacher of the visually impaired, and we had um, all the data to support that need. However, midway through the year, we had a student um, go out of district. So as a result of that, um, that student moving out of the district, we were no longer in need of the 1.0 position. So I actually already reduced that. That's already been reduced down to 0.5. And... Um, that 0.5 person is adequately servicing the students with visual impairments right now comfortably within that number. And so just to kind of highlight and summarize the expense summary. So again, tuitions account for the biggest increase in my budget. Um, also, there's a rate increase 
we get OSD pricing, which is the out-of-district pricing, and we always have to attach a, a rate increase because every year the, the tuitions go up. So we attach the point, the two percent increase to my budget. Um, and there's also been a decrease in circuit breaker this year from the state, so that um, is definitely impacting our budget. There's a decrease of three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, so I can show you the chart below, and as well as transportation. Accept transportation. Our commitment to accept transportation also contributes to the increase in my budget. So th this is just the summary of the circuit breaker revolving account projection. If you'd like me to explain it, I would be happy to do so with Susan's support. <laughs> so, so you're not seeing a decrease in the circuit breaker revenue, you're seeing a decrease in the allocation of Co that, right? Correct. We're expecting it, it to be correct. relatively even to last year correct. at 65. Okay. Yes, correct. Was that the one that decreased dramatically from previous years? Am I remembering that right? Yes. Okay. Yep. And so, so we're hoping it stays the same this year? Is that well, so what's happened is our, our appropriation, the offset that we're using for the budget this year is 600000 And the revenue that we're expecting is 370. So right off the bat, you have disconnect between your, your revenue coming in and what you're using towards your budget. So in FY19, we're, tru we're truing that. Okay. I'd like to point out, um, that because I think it's really significant, and it's really significant tonight because we just had a, a report from NASDAQ, is that in spite of the increases in enrollment within our district, you are not seeing increases in special education needs, and you're not seeing increases in, enroll in enrollment within the special education programs within the schools. Um, that would be expected with increased staffing, right? Um, and I think that's, Dr. Zaleski, a, a credit to your leadership, to you. the work that's happening within your department, um, as well as the work that's happening within the general education program that's reducing the needs for kids that need specialized services. Mm -hmm. The population of students that Karen is talking about and that we're all talking about having needs that are so significant that we cannot meet them within the district are what's resulting in the increased out-of-district cost. And I think it, this is the time, I mean, we kind of teed it up at our last meeting, but now that Karen has gone through in detail um, what her budget looks like, to me, it, it's a little startling to think about the difference between a 10 point whatever percent increase versus one point if you take that that piece out of her budget which then in turn affects our entire budget um, I think it's it's really um, really clear when you describe it in this way how much of an impact that is having on not only your budget but on the entire budget sure. but, uh, to, Dr. McLeod, on, yep. uh, to the point you were making earlier about right. the, the lack of increase in 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 district correct um, you know the, one of the things that has been happening over the last few few years through through both of you is the, inc the increase in focus on positions like this grade two through five right. special education coach right. mm -hmm. as an alternative to a special education teacher. And I don't think people have an appreciation for the amount of leverage you can get mm -hmm. from a position like that in the pre on the more preventative side rather than just increasing the resources to, to meet that what invariably the, the, the students who will, who will end up you know, needing IEPs or those types of things. I, I think this is something that um, is a relatively new it phenomenon is. in terms of, of education, and I think we're, we're seeing some great planning and therefore some great results that, uh, around utilizing these positions. And, and thank, thank you. you for calling that out. Sorry, Karen, and I'll just jump in and then throw it your way. Um, thank you for pointing that out, John, because it's all around the prevention piece of all, you know, and this is another example of how Karen works with the building principals and with all of the teachers. We've said all along, we're not looking to reduce SPED positions. We're looking to work together to meet the needs of all students across gen ed special education populations to provide them with the very best instructional interventions. Mm -hmm. um, I'll let you take it from there. I agree, and thank you for pointing that out because I, you know, one of the things that I always say when I meet with the team chairs and the faculty is we want to have a proactive, not a reactive approach in our department. Because um, oftentimes in our department, it can be very emotionally charged when you're dealing with student service delivery, and really, to the, the best way to manage that is to be proactive and put in strategies and solutions and problem solve with families. Um, 
to better service the students in the best way possible. In tier one starts in the gen ed classroom and, and our special ed students are sitting in that gen ed classroom. So really that it's, it's just so so critical. I want to show you folks a chart if you don't mind. It's, it wasn't part of your, your um, packet, but I did a little bit of research. This, was a, this is a comparison report. Actually, this was included in one of Dr. Kavanaugh's presentations that she had done. Um, in terms of our district, um, here's Hopkinton. So we're, we're at a 0.6% with our out of district. And if you look across at, at like towns, some of them are much higher. So as a, as a district as a whole, and compared across different towns, we're doing quite well. So I, I wanted to point that out to you. So although the 10% you know, increase is high with the tuitions, this, this information um, just kind of gives you an idea what other towns are doing and you know, the number of students that they have uh, sitting in our district placements. So it's really this bottom line. But it actually well, well, speaks, the line above it, too. It speaks yeah. to what we're just talking about with well, the in-district. That's, in that's right. I mean, that right. is, that number right there is remarkable um, when we think about the percentage uh, across, across the state mm -hmm. and expectations around, you know, true LD. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a really nice number. Right. That's a very compelling slide, and I wonder what it would have looked like five years ago. And I think, you know, to, to echo the point John was making, which, you know, struck me as we were looking through this as well, um, I think that that's my, my hypothesis, if you will, is that, that those numbers are the result of a sustained proactive mm -hmm. approach um, on many different levels, primarily focused in the early education area. Um, that we are starting to see those differences. And I would really, really like to have a copy of that slide for our <laughs> next budget meeting, just because you know, it's so hard to, all of this is a lot of dollars, and so putting this in the context, again, of how we are managing as compared to our peer districts is, you know, ultimately, this is so, all so much money, everything that we ask for the school budget, but it all comes down to the value that we're providing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's just a very compelling slide. So I would love to have a Sure, I, I can share it with Dr. McLeod's permission with the school committee. I might get like a t-shirt or whatever, <laughs> but um, no, it, it, that's really great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I apologize it wasn't in your packets. No, no. After I put together the executive summary for submission, yeah. I did research because I, you know, I listen to my colleagues out there as I sit on my, my roundtable meetings with them, and I was like, I know there's going to be data to support this. And when I went through Carol's slides, I found it, and I pulled it, and I was like, oh, I have to bring this to the meeting. So Yeah, thank you. It's great. If you share it with Megan, oh, she'll get it to everybody. Perfect. I will do That'll that. That'll be awesome. And it's another plug for those radar reports that Dr. Kavanaugh was talking about. It is a <laughs> definite, <laughs> yes. right? Free data. Free data. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. so other questions? Okay. I had a question, and this could just be my, the way I'm reading it. The ESY expenses, I didn't see how that fits into your budget. Oh, okay. So last year we had, um, so let me just talk, talk about the personnel side of it first. There was a th roughly a $53,000 savings in personnel in ESY. So if you look at my level service budget right now, the question would be, well, why is it level service if you, didn't use $53,000 of that money last year. So the reason that there was a savings in the budget last year was Dan was new as an ESY coordinator, and he and I sat, and we really strategically analyzed together how students are being placed in programs because in alignment with our instructional plan model in, in the summer, we also want to make sure we're making the best use of adults in the classroom. And so we really assigned students by grade level with specific teaching staff. And by doing that, and, and, and also the number of ch children that enrolled, we didn't need as many staff. So that was, that was, a, that was a plus. And the kids, kids benefited too because we had direct instruction to meet their needs by grade level. But I level service the budget because I think, Nancy, I know where you might be going with this based on all of our you conversations at yeah. CPAC, um, is so with that $53,000 savings, I level serviced it because I'm protecting those funds. We've talked a lot in CPAC about, and on the ESY committee, about offering um, enhanced social skills opportunities for students in the community. 
So my thinking is by protecting that money in the budget, and I also put a line item um, in under the ESY section of my Form 1 in the budget of $1,000. Dan and I are confident that we can offer some transportation and some field trip activities that are meaningful and educationally sound, but it might require a couple more paraprofessionals in the summer or maybe an extra teaching staff, so we're protecting those funds along with the additional $1,000 we added for transportation because when we checked with Accept Collaborative, that was the, kind of the ballpark figure they gave us for a handful of, of trips we might want to do. Um, so that's that's the reason, and it is in the budget. I, so that is exactly the information I was looking for. I think I missed it somehow. Is it in? It, are those numbers in the? So so built in the in the es the overall esy um, is it onto salaries, Susan? Just to refresh my memory. Yeah. So okay, if, that's you, nice. if you go through um, Nancy, the, the esy is broken out in several different lines. Okay. You'll see um, esy teachers, esy uh, contracted services, esy. Um, That's thank you. That does help me. To air salaries. So it's some of the, it's yeah. in a whole bunch of different lines depending on what it is. That's great. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much for you, that. You're welcome. Detailed explanation. Done. And if I can say one other thing about my budget, I know no, folks have not asked a question about this, but I want to say it because I know um, parents are going to be very interested in hearing this. Um, we talked a lot about the transition coordinator, mm -hmm. yep. and so we've uh, we've contracted with Accept Collaborative. So in working with Becky and she came and did a presentation to CPAC and looking at our data. We don't have a need for a position, so that's why I'm not requesting a position, but we definitely have a need to increase her services. So what I've done is I've uh, doubled the contracted service amount. Great. So that's really so good. It'll be 10, 10 hours ten, a month? It'll be 10 hours a month, yep. And she, um, you know, we've already done a lot of great work with our older students who are older even beyond high school students this year. And next year, we're really confident that with that increase, we'll be able to touch more students still sitting at the high school. Her along and Pat, alongside with Caitlin Burke and um, Mike and the folks at the high school together as a team, because she really did explain to us and gave us some good education this year about transition planning isn't about having one person come in and do it all. It's really about taking the entire team and then each person parceling out what they can do to best manage students and provide them post-secondary opportunities. Um, so we did agree in looking at what she's currently doing, what the needs still are, and now that our staff, too, have a better understanding, they're able to do more, mm -hmm. which is wonderful because sure. we can really capitalize on our resources. Um, but we did double her, so I want families to know that. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because that's definitely something that's come up over the years. Sure. So that's really helpful. That's, yeah. Um, that's really helpful to know. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have questions or can we offer... I think she did a fabulous job explaining, um, you. you know, you answered my questions uh -huh. uh, that I had jotted down in your summary. Thank so you. This is great. And just knowing the difference, um, you know, of your budget versus the tuition. And just to be clear, this one does not include the out-of-district tuitions, right? Well, this, the preliminary yeah. summary includes the out-of-district tuitions at the 10% rate. Okay. It does, yeah. Mike and Rebecca, did you have questions? I did not. Okay. Wow. Well, so we're ready for our round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, and before you leave, we are, I don't know where we are with the out of district discussion. So, in terms of getting direction from you, I think we all know it's there. And as we look at our percent, when we're, what our percent is at and what, what we're working towards, mm -hmm. it will continue to be a number. I think it's an after we see everything. Okay. Personally, it's, I feel like it's an after we see everything okay. conversation because this is kind of a, it, it's. Or is so your question, do we continue to call it out separately? Right. Yeah. That's the I, question. Oh. I, go ahead. So my thought in looking at sort of the town wide is some of this is not going to, a lot of it, my understanding is not going to reoccur for fiscal year 2020. That we'll have the expenses, but there's, the way the money comes in and out is this is like a stop gap kind of a thing. Is that this year's issue? The, 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 yes, that we're not going to have the same level of issue in 2020 as we do in 2019. It's going to start to get better, but it's going to take a while. So the hope <coughs> is that you would not see the the change in out of district um, tuitions itself. Okay. Year yeah. over year. So you know we haven't seen that that. Right type of a change year over year in just out of district tuitions. This is a correction to the to the offset. 
So if we pull it out and make it a separate thing with the town, it doesn't get built back into our budget. It for is next part of your budget. It, is, it yeah. will. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So either way, it will be. Yes. Either, either way. way. Yep. But, but that's I part do think of the correction that that's needed. Helps. Sorry, Jane. Go ahead. So maybe just calling it out separately as we go through it and as we get towards the end and we have a total number with and without. Mm -hmm. yeah, because it's not, it, so it's a reset, it's a one-time okay. reset to fix the application of the offset, but it is the new baseline. Right. Right, so it's not, it's not like a one-time, it's not like a one-time hit type of item where we somehow oh. pay an extra 300 grand this year and it, it it's away. a one-time hit that drops back off. This is a shift in the way that we're funding that, but the actual number is not going right. down. But so, so that's if, the new baseline. If we pull it out, the downside for us will be next year either way, that it's going to make either a percentage. Yeah, it's not At not. some point, we're going to have a jump in the percent of what our increased yeah. operating budget I, is. I, and, I, and, sorry. I was just going to say, I think I think just from the, at the overall perspective and understanding of the budget, it does, it does give an unfair um, view in terms of how much the school committee's budget is, is potentially increasing when you see how it fits into the total. That's all. I, I think, so my <coughs> opinion is that we should continue to, I think, highlight it separately for that reason, mm -hmm. um, because I think it, it is an, an understanding. That, but in terms of whether, like, pulling it out it, it's not a one-time expense, so it's coming out of operating budget anyway. Yes. So, right. even if we somehow could run it as a separate budget item, it's still in the overall town yeah. level tax yeah. levy. So, it, I don't think it matters. Okay. I mean, this yeah, it's just a communication yeah. okay. piece that we can That's we can figure about. out the yeah. right yeah. presentation. But I mean, the point is, it makes a major impact on our overall budget, and the I think what we're trying to communicate is this is pretty much of a non-negotiable just because of the expenses that it is that it covers and so to be clear the school district isn't you know putting in a swimming pool in the, the atrium of the high school like it's a, a very critical need it's not like a, a, an accumulation of nice to haves I think that's yeah. the point of the communication yeah. not so much not that it would be voted separately or anything like that but just to, I think the point is to, to communicate that specifically right. um, because it's a special circumstance, I think is sort of my takeaway from where we are in the conversation. That and to see it within the context of the, all of the other things that are right. going on with, within the special education budget, you know, and this, this, uh, this slide that you showed us, the radar slide. Because very good news in our right. special education budget Correct. is your point. So That's my point. Thank you, Jean. I think when, <laughs> as we move forward to weigh against, it, we're going to, if there's a way to keep it in the budget without having it negatively impact our ability to use the operating budget that we need. Got you know it. I, mean? now, I don't want to have us cutting all kinds of our right. regular programs. Right. right. But it's really, in, it's really explaining this. and communicating what our percent increase is, including the out of district. That's right. And, and how it affects everything. Okay. Okay. Yep. Did we do Thank our you. applause? You did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take it again. Take it again. again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can we go to three now? Uh, right. I know. I, oh, I think Ashok right. should get extra credit for staying. I, I know. Yeah. He should get applause on the front and the end. I'm so Dr. sorry. Zaleski, how late Thank you for Thank that. You Thank you very much. Presentation. Yeah, we are nuts way wildly off our time, but fly it's through the rest really ranging. important. Yeah, if you're, if <laughs> you're still <laughs> willing. Do this enough. You expect nothing less. <laughs> you get more applause just for that. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Um, all right. Technology. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Just gonna make us all yeah. Oh, because we still haven't done central office yet. Nope. Yes, I'm ready. I'm just okay. Waiting for instructions. I think we're oh. ready. <laughs> we're, we're ready. <coughs> um, thanks, Ashok. Thanks for being here and thanks oh, for waiting. No and um, I think if you just jump in, that would be great. Okay. Thanks. Sure.
Um, so just to talk uh, quickly about uh, strategic initiatives and priorities for the district, uh, for the technology department, uh, I think this budget uh, will support, you know, the following items, uh, ideally supporting the development expansion of information systems uh, and hardware support for one-to-one -one learning environments, uh, general overall maintenance of all the equipment uh, in the district from hardware to software to systems to even device repairs needed. Um, and then another key area is really uh, instructional software that supports learning, specifically math and, and reading enrichment and invention programs uh, throughout the district. Uh, and then the last kind of component, it really is supporting key infrastructure, network infrastructures, wireless infrastructures, uh, and, and security uh, throughout the district. So those, those kind of four points really are, are kind of what the, the budget will support um, moving forward next year. The, these numbers, hopefully just as a, a quick explanation, this PowerPoint kind of just follows the numbers, uh, hopefully, um, that you'll see in your executive summary. Um, but if you need clarification, let me know. Uh, and this slide ideally just kind of highlights um, the summative sections for each building, you know, pre-K all the way up through the high school. Uh, so um, in the middle there, that FY1716 number, that's an incorrect typo on my heart part. That should really say, uh, obviously, uh, next year's numbers. So uh, the first one, uh, pre-K is up $475. That's primarily due to an increase in software uh, needed for um, special education. Um, and that's just an up. We're having more teachers that need it and require it. So last year, for example, we only had 15 licenses. This coming year, we're going to need to support 23 licenses of that particular software. So it's a minor increase in that area. Uh, at Center School, the overall, um, you know, account is going to be under uh, this year, um, primarily because we're not putting a lot of new equipment into Center School, but we are gaining a new building. And with that new building comes some building funds that will support some of the equipment and software that's going into that building. So the, the need in the operational budget is, is small. Um, Elmwood School is, is obviously the, the biggest and largest increase uh, this year, and that uh, amount is really to support uh, new hardware, uh, primarily in third grade, but will also be shared with second grade a little bit. And those are for new Chromebook carts. Um, roughly 10 Chromebook carts uh, would be purchased with that uh, money, and that money also would include support of those Chromebook carts. Um, replacing them, uh, depot service to help get them fixed if they're, they're damaged. Um, Hopkins is down. That's primarily because uh, a lease uh, has fallen off there. So the existing Chromebook lease has come off cycle uh, at Hopkins. Uh, and most likely that number won't change, obviously, but we are going to use some funds this year to kind of leverage E-rate funds exactly to prepay some equipment that we have to replace in Hopkins. So basically, there's a whole set of Chromebooks coming out, but we have to replace those Chromebooks, and we're going to do that with E-rate money um, this year, towards the end of this year. The middle school um, is slightly up, $17,676. That increase uh, is slightly up to support a new Chromebook lease as well. So the, the Chromebooks at both the middle school and Hopkins School were all bought at the same time uh, with a fair, fair market lease over three years, and that is expired. So that equipment will be going back this summer, and we'll be purchasing a new lease uh, for new equipment at the middle school, which supports the one-to-one -one program at the middle school. And then finally, the last building, uh, all of the accounts are up really in one area. That's supporting an, uh, an AV account. So $32,000, 20, really 20,000 of that, or 25,000 roughly, uh, is going to support uh, the auditorium upgrades, uh, at least the sound equipment at the, in the uh, high school auditorium. Um, currently, that's existing equipment that's in there that's, that's been there since the building first opened. Uh, we've had some consistent issues with the, the mic lines, uh, the mixers going down. There was problems actually before the play just yesterday <laughs> where the mixer died. So it's in, it's in needs of replacement. Um, and so we've made repairs, but we're at a point where it just needs to be upgraded. So that's about a $20,000 upgrade, which could, would completely rehaul at least the speakers and the mixers and, and the equipment in there for our musicians. So that's uh, the high school. In terms of personnel, um, this year there's no increases uh, in personnel. Um, because of the tight budget message uh, from the town, um, I kind of looked internally and worked um, across all buildings to meet with principals to figure out a way that we could reduce staff. Obviously not an easy thing to do, um, but 
we felt it was necessary to get close and at uh, least the, the numbers that we needed to kind of move forward with the budget for all of you. Uh, and so after meeting with principals, uh, looking at what we could do for reductions, I'm making a recommendation to reduce uh, one of our tech integration specialists, which is one of uh, our teachers that does uh, some of the coaching uh, in the district. Um, so that is one reduction. Overall expenses. Um, this is a, the network infrastructure is an overall district account. Uh, this is an account that's down just primarily because um, we have some newer wireless equipment that we put in through some capital money this, this summer, uh, so the need wasn't as high. Uh, our tech contracted services uh, is down. We've done some consolidation with some of our accounts, and we got a cheaper uh, fiber connection this year with Cogent, so we're using a different vendor, uh, and that's saving us some money in that account. Um, this year. Overall district AV supplies, and this is the $20,000 amount, this is similar to what I just described. That, that increase in that account is primarily due because of the sound upgrades uh, in the high school uh, auditorium. Then the technology maintenance account, which is an overall account that basically um, we, we use to repair all major equipment district-wide, uh, we reduced by $5,000 this year. Part of that offset Offset is really, we're looking at some of the new leases this year. We're, we're making a decision to buy, um, you know, depot-type service, meaning instead of repairing some of the Chromebooks internally, we're going to ship them out and have them re repaired on a warranty coverage uh, because over the last three years we've learned that uh, they're very expensive to maintain and repair in-house and we're not saving any money. We'll actually try to, we'll actually save money by, by exporting them out and getting them fixed externally. So we can reduce our maintenance account a little bit to cover that, uh, and that's where you'll see the balance. So the increase on the lease, but that lease does cover repair service. Uh, instructional technology uh, is up 32,000, uh, and this is really just supporting the new um, equipment at Hopkins School and the new equipment at Elmwood primarily, which would be the 10 Chromebook carts, uh, primarily for grade three. Uh, not that it's the only thing that we're looking for, but high stakes testing, MCAS 2.0, uh, is moving down eventually to third grade, and that's not really the only reason why we want this type of technology in the classroom, but it is a big factor that we need to prepare our third graders for. So having that equipment at Elmwood School to get them ready for that test is important, and those Chromebooks will help do that. Instructional software across the district is down, so we've looked at usage and consolidated some of the subscriptions that we have uh, throughout the buildings. Professional development is also down by $2,500. Um, we've been able to leverage some of our internal professional development. Uh, some of our coaches have, uh, have helped out and run a lot of the training internally, so we haven't had to contract out to, to many providers, so we've been able to reduce our, our funds over the years uh, in professional development. And then that's it. Mm -hmm. Try to make it short and sweet for you all. I'm sure there will be questions. Uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you have and go into details. Question about the Elmwood uh, Chromebooks. So does that make the Elmwood the third grade anyway, one to one? Uh, they would, yeah. So there would be it'd be enough to have a cart per classroom. Okay. So there's two existing carts there now. So we would add another ten to get enough to have one and per class. Ten classroom. is enough for each student in the classroom, or is yeah. Well, no, sorry. So the the cart that's ten cards. So within the within the cart, you'd have 24 to 25 devices, which would, should support enough of uh, the kids in each classroom. Correct. Any other questions? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so on the um, Chromebooks, you were also talking about MCAS readiness. Mm -hmm. um, does it would, it, they, would they be using a trackpad or a mouse separately when they're? Uh, they would be using a trackpad. So when they take the actual test on a Chromebook, they're using they're using the trackpad. So that is a that is a skill that they need to start developing at an earlier age. Um, and just witnessing and seeing some of that with some of the online testing this year, uh, getting some of the feedback from teachers, that's definitely a skill that we need to work on at a, at a younger age. And they would be using the Chromebooks to take the test? They would take the Chromebooks on the test, yes. Chromebooks are still probably one of the best devices to use in that type of environment for testing. Um, now, I don't know, in high school for the one-to-one -one program, mm -hmm. is it offset by, you know, anything? Parents pay for it. Okay, and uh, is that not something that we would think of in this case? 
The difference is parents, so that with the one-to-one -one laptops, the parents, they, they get the computer at the end of it. Okay. So, so whereas case, this is, and these they can are use existing yeah. computers right. as well. Yeah, I see. Yeah. But okay. also the kids bring them home, where it's right. at, um, with, In know, this case, it would remain. It's more part of classroom well, instructional school. materials. We consider it that way because it belongs in the classroom. Okay. But it is a good distinction, Mina. The, yeah. Though we do have loaner, I, I, I do also want to point that out. At the, yeah, so the, the high school before. program, there's three ways to participate. So the, the high school students can either uh, loan and, and use a, a, a device from the school, which is a, as a MacBook Air. They can lease to own or they can bring their own device. So that's the current environment at the high school. And about 80% of the students usually do the lease to own program and buy the computer outright. So they, they own it when they pay for it by their senior year and they take it with them. Yep. These other devices are purchased solely by the operating budget. The middle school devices obviously go home with the kids and then from grades five down, the devices usually stay in the classroom. Um, and then we're starting to have some conversations about maybe what fifth grade looks like and how do we help manage fifth grade at home? Because there's been some interesting conversations with parents and. And obviously we have a lot um, more systems in place to help manage those devices and not all parents have that at home. So trying to manage a device at home for a kid can be challenging. So if we're starting to have more and more uh, digital homework at home where kids <coughs> have to be on a device, uh, those devices need to be protected so that the kids can start to work on those devices independently without maybe having a parent watch. And so a kid doing a, a homework uh, on an iPhone that's not necessarily protected or has web filters on it is very different mm. than say a device coming home from us that has a web filter on it and has some security on it. So we're starting to get to a point maybe in fifth grade where we start, we're starting to have some pilots where we're sending a couple of devices home with kids to see how that is because there could come a point where maybe it makes sense to give parents an option to take a device home in fifth grade just for the security and safety of doing regular work at home. Um, the other question I have is on the projectors and um, now, sure. the projectors that we uh, install, mm -hmm. my understanding is that they tend to be on a um, different network than, let's say, someone who is renting the space. For instance, um, they get to be on the guest network, so hook up to the projectors tends to be a bit of a challenge. So when we put in these new projectors, would that be something that would that could be considered and taken care of? Um, the pro well, the projectors typically don't have any any connection right now to the wireless network. So there's they're two, think of them as two separate things. So this is a projector. This projector is not connected to our internet connection or network at all. Okay. So it's and then there's the wireless, which 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 allows people to get onto the internet. There's a guest network that those those people can log into, um, but that though they work independently. So, so these are wired. Is that what you're saying? Connected. Um, to these can be wired. So mo so most of these are all wired. So right now I'm wired into this, sure. and so most classrooms you can wire directly into a projector if you're using that space. Some of our common spaces now starting to have some like Apple TV type devices right, in that's them. What so that's I was so those to. those devices uh, allow you to c connect you know Wireless. wirelessly right, That's right. Um, and so most common spaces uh, if we know ahead of time we can give them those codes if, if need be so people can connect to them we just don't want those codes out publicly for most spaces because kids can play games when you put those codes out okay. right so I could be sitting in another classroom and see this Apple TV on the network and I can throw up whatever I want on that on that screen from that classroom down the hall <laughs> right. so you can't you can't just freely give out those codes so we do have a system in place that all the all the secretaries and the building staff have access to those codes. So if someone's coming in and needs a space, they can definitely have access to those codes to use it for a presentation or an after school session. Okay. okay. And so these new projectors that mm -hmm. uh, you're requesting, mm -hmm. would these have the Apple TV? Um, no, we only there's not really much money in the budget at all for Apple TVs. <laughs> so uh, there is very few projectors coming in uh, this year in this this budget. There's uh, roughly four, I think, four or five at the middle school, uh, and the same at the high school. Uh, so very very small number. Uh, that's not enough to replace the the ones that need to be replaced currently in those two buildings. The other advantage is we're saving some money because we're going to pull all the projectors out of center school, hopefully this summer and use those in all the other spaces. Uh, so any, any dying projector at the elementary schools, uh, we will replace with the ones at center school. Um, so we're going to do that um, this summer. Very 
So really, we'll have about 23 projectors from center school, and then we'll have 10 new projectors from the operating budget. I have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, one is, uh, you know, with the new transportation policy or the po transportation policy and the discussion, I think some of the concerns that the principals had shared, was that something you were able to look at and think about when coming up with the proposal um, in terms of the solutions that they might need? I think we talked <coughs> about possibly some hardware or software that might help them. Sure. Is there, um, you know, operational issues that they were mm. talking about? Yeah, there's, I mean, at one point several years ago, I think um, we had met with a vendor uh, at Hopkins School um, and looked at some software that helps manage primarily, um, you know, after school pickup and bus line management. Um, and so there are some types of software that, that will do that. Um, it, it goes as far as maybe even allowing parents to submit a request online where that kind of feeds into a system and you can get those requests. Um, so there are some systems that would help with that, um, and we can definitely look at those, but there's nothing in the budget that would support those purchases this year. Um, but I think we could explore those this year and figure out what types of systems would work well for that, and what, and if at all, would they really change the challenges that we have at pickup time. Um, so technology, for most part, can solve a lot of our problems, but sometimes it can't solve all of the problems or change. <laughs> people's behaviors or habits at, I, I, at, from time I, to time. Um, but I would definitely be willing to explore that, and I think there's definitely some ways to alleviate some of the chaos at, at pickup. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, but the bigger picture is looking at how those systems integrate with our current student information system, for example, and how we get busing data from, let's say, power school to that, and it, to that new system, and is it, does it even work well enough to make it easier for people? So we could explore those options, and we could maybe report back on a few types of software um, later this year and see if it's feasible. Sure. And the last question is on the website itself. I think mm -hmm. you've had some conversations sure. around it. Mm -hmm. Is that something that will get covered with the current, um, you know, projection or for where the, would that fit in? Yeah, I think the idea primarily for the goal this year was to become, um, just make sure we were compliant uh, with ADA requirements, you know. So the goal was to really make sure that all the the, the current uh, content on the website met those requirements. And so currently the staff is kind of working on that to make those fixes, and so that was kind of the first goal that we were working on. And then the second goal, we, we we're obviously open to suggestions on from the school committee or other departments on how they would like to see it changed or updated. Um, so that's something we can work on um, in January, the second part of this year, and we're happy to do that. Um, so, but you don't need any additional um, funding to do that? No, unless we're talking something crazy as far as the changes. We have in this operating budget enough money to maintain the subscription to our web services, uh, which is a hosting fee, and, and they host our website. Um, and so it would just be internal staff making those changes. Uh, if the school committee says, hey, we want our school committee page to uh, be wild and crazy and look like this, you just tell us and we could do that for you. Yeah. Okay. Does it improve our image at all? Yeah, we can, <laughs> we can give photos, videos, whatever you would like up there, and, and we're happy to do that. All right. Well, so For no extra money. If there's no, yeah, <laughs> if, I was to say, if there's no budget impact, let's defer that to yeah. a different time. Does anybody else have other questions, or can we turn it over to appropriations? I have a, a couple. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned in your summary is that we're continuing to work towards a goal of a one-to-one -one environment in grades K to 12. So I thought on the early elementary, the technology plan was still one to two. Yeah, so we, we've, when we first did the tech integration, not tech integration plan, but the technology plan, the three-year plan, uh, that was our goal, to have kind of two-to-one ratio, you know, looking at roughly grades K through through five. Um, and I think in the interim, state came out with recommendations about having a goal of one-to-one -one for, for school districts. Uh, and then kind of MCAS 2.0, if you will, had a larger impact on the need to have more devices. <coughs> uh, and then I think there were some changes really with philosophy around where equipment is in buildings and having device and equipment more in classroom versus lab spaces and other common spaces. And so we've really stopped funding you know, if you look in, in this library, in a one-to-one -one environment, there's not a single 
desktop, really not many in here that we've had to, to purchase uh, because of the one-to-one -one environment. So, so some of those changes, I think, have, have led us to kind of look to see if we could be at least, you know, one-to-one -one, um, K through 12. Um, and we know that that's not going to happen right away. Um, you know, still second grade will still be, um, you know, probably just getting close to the two-to-one ratio this summer with the new Chromebooks. Um, so they would, at right now, the elementary schools <coughs> below that are roughly six devices per classroom, six iPads per classroom That's from right. uh, grades three below. Yeah, and so it's, it's going to be, you've led right into my next question. So th those have traditionally been iPads, but you also mentioned that Correct. the trackpad skill development, if you Correct. will. So were you thinking of pushing Chromebooks down a little further? We're, too? we're hoping that the cards, at least in third grade, could be shared with some of the second grade teachers enrolled into those classrooms to be used from time to time. But still, from second grade down to pre-K, we would support iPads in that touch environment for the younger, <coughs> younger kids because it's still in that transit. There needs to be a transition, but there's still, you know, when you try to get them logged into devices and, and using apps, the, the iPad obviously makes a little more sense for the younger kids. Um, with the Chromebook yes. hardware, so that's not that, that's not real expensive or hardware to purchase. So what do we, what kind of... The are, like the repairs, you mean? The actual, the, the, the actual devices. So I guess the, what's the, so it, what's the thought process of the three-year lease? Are we still paying less, or is it more about a staying technologically current? Uh, part of it is the change, but um, part of it is they aren't as cheap as I would like them to be. So you think an average device may cost, you know, three let let's say, but then you have to buy a, a Chrome license for it, which is $25. And then you're looking at another $75 to $90 for warranty coverage. So that $299 device quickly becomes close to $400 a device. And so when you look at that, for example, for, um, let's say, the middle school, you're looking at a $600,000 purchase. That's one time what I was looking purchase. For that. Yeah, so, yeah that, so that would you know be a huge yeah. jump uh, in, in, in our budget in one year. And the last thing is just a comment. Um, you know, I think we tend to look at these, I think when we, because we do this once a year, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's important to look back on this. And I distinctly remember that last year you had a particular focus on personnel and building up who we need, you know, who we needed to be able to support this technology integration. And right. I think even took some hits on some devices you wanted to do mm -hmm. because that was your strategic investment. Correct. And I just wanted to point out that this year we have absolutely no personnel ads allowing so i mean it just to me it's a credit to you in terms of your planning and budgeting that that was a focus last year it was successful we come into this year we don't need any additional personnel you've met that need and we can continue working on the devices so i just wanted to highlight that too because i think that's maybe that's your round of applause this time <laughs> but i think that's that is it shows the multi-year planning that the that the entire school district does but i think it's a particular highlight Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I, I just a quick comment. Sure. Uh, I, I this goes back from a discussion we had, a, I think, at the same time last year about the lease payments for the laptop, mm -hmm. and I noticed that the the notice for those did come out to give family time families time to think about it um, between now and May. That we the discussion we'd had was that people were getting bus fees at the same time as mm -hmm. laptop yeah. fees, and I just I wanted to thank you for taking that into consideration for sure. people. Sure. I'll just jump into that wagon, if I may, before it goes to appropriations. So I also wanted to point out, um, you know, the impact that Ashoka's budget clearly has on everything that everybody does um, and the oversight that it takes to, to have the rollout of all of it. You know, there's nothing worse than getting ready to teach a lesson or do a presentation and have this technology that we all just depend upon and have begun to take for granted. We talk a lot <clears throat> about how, you know, even two years ago, teachers would double plan because just in case the technology fails, I want to make sure I have, you know, also the paper ready to go. Um, and something Ashok talks to us all about, you know, is that one-to-one -one doesn't necessarily mean that kids are spending the day with a computer in front of them. It's one-to-one -one access that he's, you know, helping us to understand. So I wanted to mention that, but I also wanted to make sure that we all were noting um, all of the numbers that were in parentheses on Ashok's budget. Mm -hmm. And so this is not simply a level-funded budget that he took and said, okay, as long as 
as long as I don't have any increases. He worked really hard with his department to see the areas in which he could decrease. Um, and there were a lot of them as you look at the many slides that we saw up here tonight. So um, thank you, Ashok, for all of the work that you've done to bring this budget to us tonight. It's such a thorough job. Thank you. That's a good point. I was I was going to say that there were a lot of negatives, there and I, could, I got, but that sounds, sounds like bad. a negative <laughs> statement. <laughs> and the correct word is decrease. I couldn't right. come up with that, so that's thank late. you. But that's it why is late. Late. Make sure we. Thank yeah. you very much. So, uh, Mike and Rebecca, anything? Just have one question. I sure. know um, this is kind of focused on the schools, but where does the budget for the administrators and all, and all the technologies that they need, where does that fall in the budget? Is that under central? Does this fall for the uh, personal uh, technology yeah. for administrators? Mm -hmm. That typically falls under, it's called the system wide network account. So we typically put some uh, money in there for, for them and also for special ed purchases mm -hmm. uh, that we have to make uh, throughout the year. Okay. So if a student's diagnosed and they need a device, we buy it out of that, out of that account. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the one thing I want to say is, I, if I understand this correctly, I think last year we had a, an issue where we had a, a real need, a big bump, and you know because everyone needed, we're getting laptops or it was Chrome, and the kind of the suggestion was to we kind of work on a plan where it's over year over year. There's no big spikes. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's no there's no spike in this. It's like now we're under a plan of it's going to be. Some are on lease, some are coming off, and then it's going to be a consistent. So if that's the way you're trying yes. to, that's intentional, I like it. We're trying to, yeah. I know, I think in years past, I've shared my projections out to 2025 as far as managing all the leases. So, you know, this year, this year, for example, there's no, you know, there's no new teacher lease payments that we're making right now. So that drops it a little bit and allows us to bring in some of the newer equipment at Hopkins or Elmwood. I think ending with a compliment from Mike is worthy of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Very well. Thank you. <laughs> that was well, nice. Just because last year, I think we had to do, we did, you know, a little creative yeah. where we put it in oh. under free cash or we did something right. outside of the budget because right. it was a one time thing and the request was to try and make it part of the strategy. Sure. So it's in the budget, no spikes, and we can that's right. plan for it. Good memory as well. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Yeah. Nice job. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome to stay. Yes. Thanks to show. If you like, <laughs> please, please do not stay. We don't stay. expect you to. Do not stay. Um, so the central office. I don't know why I was closing yeah, my binder. Yeah, you're not <laughs> done. Um, I, who, is, who is presenting this? Susan. Okay. So the central office um, is, is actually somewhat small. It really consists of just your, your central office. Um, administration but the piece that's in here that you'll see is a budget for um, salary increases for negotiations there's no new positions um, and so that's the personnel side of it on the expense side really the big increase is the um, potential for the new bus uh, transportation contract that we're going out to bid for um, so I spoke earlier about this bringing this increase in at an estimate of what you had looked at two years ago when you had gone to bid and um, they had come in with a price and you had decided to go with those two additional years on the existing contract um, due to the, the, the increase that they had given you two years ago. So that's where I used as a, as a baseline to bring the FY19. So that's why it looks like such a, a large number. Um, I am preparing that bid now, so hopefully we'll have numbers, um, you know, long before Maytown meeting, but, um, you know, in the near future. The other piece that is in here is also uh, a cost for um, GPS, adding GPS to uh, the buses. The other increase, um, small but somewhat significant, is really in your legal expenses as well. And that's really a reflection of what's actually going on today with um, public records requests and just the increase uh, of time that we need to use for an attorney to vet different things that are being requested of the school department. Okay. That's it in a nutshell. Any questions? Um, is it at all possible that we'll know the bus number before we actually vote on the budget? 
Or it will be somewhere between that and town meeting that will. Uh, hopefully, we'll have it before January. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. Is the GP sorry? Is the GPS upgrade in the three hundred six thousand? No, it's uh, if you look at the. Technology, superintendent's technology. Okay. I'm estimating around 4,000. Okay. Just give me a Anybody else? Any other questions? I don't have a question. I have a comment. That's allowable. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate that there are no changes to the price of a bus pass. I in terms of not looking to increase it. I know that the school committee had looked prior to me being on the school committee talked about decreasing and I, I know this is not the year to look to decrease it perhaps but it might be something that we could put out towards a future budget mm -hmm. to consider again. Mm -hmm. Just back to the dirty fees. Mm -hmm. Dirty word fees. I think last year was Last the year, we first year, same. the first yeah. year we didn't right. in probably three years, right? I think it's the first yeah. year there that we did nothing because no, the year decreased. before we yeah, eliminated year we elementary entirely, and we didn't. I think we didn't de decrease the, um, the, the same? middle school and high school. I think has been so that would be this would be the third year that it's the same. same. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So last year we just did nothing, and the year before we el eliminated elementary. Or did we el eliminate within, elementary the last year? No, apparently it was two years ago. Was it two years ago? Before, before I was on the committee. It, it was. It, oh. It, last year, it, all elementary was free. Okay. Regardless of where you live. And I, I guess I, what I'm saying is I support the sentiment of my predecessors who ultimately wanted to see those <laughs> decreased and hopefully eliminated at some point. But not obviously this year our funding is very challenging. So. Thank you. Anything else? Mike, I'll Rebecca? just say, oh, oh I just want to, because I've been wanting to make sure I make a comment about all of this work, is that to just it's just been delightful to work with Susan. And um, we're clearly at the beginning of all of this, but because she just covered center, central office. Um, and um, I just wanted to say that, just, you know, the way in which she listens to everybody, she has been so quickly up to speed on and willing to do it the way in which we've done it in the past to help us kind of um, navigate the change in, you know, in, in her leadership. Um, but we have quickly come to depend on her um, very much so. So thank you, Susan. Thanks. I remember we, I think Lori asked you the hard how do you dis how do you explain the circuit breaker question in yes, your interview? She did. And you you really you've done a good she job of, of making very um, hard things more easily yes. understand right. understandable. And there were a lot of hard there have been a lot of hard things yep. uh, in this in this context of this budget. So and, and your ability to look in different doing things in a different way that's cost savings and efficiencies that we didn't have before. So right. oh, I speak, would agree with that. speaking of which, I know are we going to talk about food service? Is that in this? Um, so that does so food service is its own separate revolving account right um, so it does not really contain or fall within the operating budget Got it does it. not have an effect okay but the addition of the staff member is also paid out of the revolving account also paid okay out of the okay revolving. okay all right <clears throat> Thank so you. that yeah. comes up when we think about re the when the contract comes up not in the budget not in the budget right so the the um, you had already said that you agreed with not putting the contract out again. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mike and Rebecca? I have a little question. I noticed that there is an increase in the superintendent's salary for next year. Is that reflective of a new position no. or? Okay. No. It, just like everybody else, as if you saw, um, it's a great question, but if you saw in each of the building budgets, um, it's what's already been um, budgeted for. The visit in my so when people look for yeah, yeah. Applying to no. the job, like, oh, <laughs> right? You know, it's not a promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Mike, anything? Nope. All right. I think we owe Susan a round of applause, <laughs> <laughs> and also all of us because we made it through. Yes. Um, you know, with only an additional ninety minutes. And we've lost.
off feeling in our fingers and toes. Yes, yeah. we are so clearly saving so money on our heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm um, saving that high school utility cost. No, it's <laughs> always the change of season is. issue. Yeah. It is. Um, uh, with your permission, I just want to make one comment. Sure. Um, this is, of course, my first year just going through the budget. And I am so excited just listening through all of this. Of course, I ask a lot of questions. And uh, at the same time, clearly, there's a lot of work that has gone in. You can see the vision and the ambition to you know, have everything that they, they're looking for, all the departments, looking for the kids, yep. right? And yep. also trying to offset it yep. in ways that they can. So it's very, very... Um, you know, I'm very, very impressed with how the whole process has worked. And it just speaks to um, the competence of, of your team. They're remarkable. Mm -hmm. And no wonder we are where we are as a school district. That's, That's absolutely true. right. I'm so glad you see that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. OK. Um, all right, so I think we are ready, <coughs> finally, right, to move along. Mm -hmm. And again, you all are welcome to stay, but we don't expect you to <laughs> want to do that. Um, so we'll move quickly into liaison reports. Does anybody have liaison reports? <laughs> oh, I, I have a couple, you but I have a big one. one. Yeah, I do. Thank you for coming. Take and why? Yeah, I do. It's on my list. Does anybody have any? Because uh, I do have several, so I can go I last. get a brief one. Um, so CPAC met on Tuesday, Tuesday night. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh presented uh, the MCAS to the CPAC and did a very nice job of talking about differences in the way the new the MCAS 2.0. She, she made a nice presentation, and there was some interest in a follow-up presentation from okay. her. So. Nobody loves data like Dr. Uh, you, you can see the excitement in her eyes yes. when they ask questions she makes, about data. She makes the data. it seem exciting. Um, so very quickly, on the turf field uh, front, we did get the approval on Monday from um, the Con Conservation Commission for our notice of intent. So what that means is that the permitting for phase one and phase two, which is the field <coughs> three football stadium, all of that permitting is approved as of now so that's very exciting they um, really appreciated the work that we all have done with them to try to make uh, to, to solve the long-standing issue of the um, obligation of the wetlands report and so you heard Tim um, confirm that that the money for the design is in his budget and we are carrying a capital warrant article that we'll work with the town on um, for the construction so they were very very appreciative of our proact well it's hard to call it proactive because it's 20 years old but <laughs> reactive Re yes to with appreciate a hyphen. that we're finally addressing it yes, yeah <laughs> they're pretty sorry. um in addition john and i both attended a forum that was put on by educate hockington related to all the fields in town um and so there were a lot of really good questions that came out of that forum not surprisingly a lot of them were related to the turf fields not all of them um but we thank them for that opportunity and i think that that it's on hcam already um so people can watch it if they missed it um we had our budget advisory group meeting on tuesday mm -hmm. losing track big of day days tuesday was. <laughs> tuesday was a big day um and that actually i thought went quite well um i agree we um we, you know, not a lot of progress was made, but we sort of all are in the same boat, it feels like, this year. Everybody yeah. is having similar struggles to what we are in terms of just kind of a lot of catch-up seems to be happening across the town in yes. all departments this year. So um, that's not necessarily good news for our tax bills, but it, it was interesting that it was so consistent. And then um, additionally, it just say that we have started contract negotiations with our teachers union and I always look forward to working well and collaboratively with them throughout that process um, and nothing on the building there was a meeting but it uh, I guess the sort of good news that came out of it is they're gonna have a room um, forget the term right now but basically a model room you know, set up <gasps> soon Cool. Yeah, it's, yeah, within, within uh, yeah, yeah, several weeks. I think January was the, um, so that was pretty exciting. And sitting next to Lauren and hearing that was kind of oh, exciting because she's really pretty, exciting. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, that reminds me, actually, I forgot one thing, which is that Nancy and I had lunch with Pooja, who um, is in Senator Spilka's office, and we were raving about the school, and she was really excited about the opportunity to have a tour. So maybe when that's ready, we could invite both of our um, local legislators to come for a little tour. That might be a little bit more exciting to look at than the ductwork or <laughs> whatever is still uh, visible in the rest of the building, but that's really exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Gina, I have one small update. Um, I think we had met last uh, last time after this happened. Uh, we had, uh, Dr. McLeod and I, uh, we had a visit at the senior center. It was very nice of her to make the time and join, and um, she spent a lot of time talking to all the seniors with all the activities that were going on, and I think, Jean, you were there yes. uh, with the tour, of course. Um, and later on, we met with the senior center director, Cindy Cheshmore, as well as the assistant director, Amy Beck. It was a very productive meeting where we said we're going to look for ways in which um, we can find those events where we can work together and think of ideas to uh, make sure that the relationship and the connection uh, remains and is active. Um, so we, uh, the senior center ha is considering, you know, some of the big events that we have, like the top of the hill, which is coming up, or some of the musicals that we have coming up, putting that possibly in their newsletter, um, advertising, and likewise on our end, uh, Dr. McLeod, um, we, we were looking to consider if there are events that are special at the senior center where the administrative team could take turns attending and participating. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an update. And we agreed that if, you know, um, Mina has taken it upon herself to share all of the all of the events, but what we needed from them was it, not only the interest, but if there were a number, like if there were 15 people, that we would provide tickets in advance. That's right. Um, and that kind right. of, you know, to make them feel really wanted. Mm -hmm. But so rather than handing them 20 tickets that we didn't know if they'd be filling those seats, we were leaving it to them to let us know, yes, there's an interest, and we would be happy to... Yeah. And, and I think it will take some time <clears throat> and iteration when um, one of the challenges is some of our events happen later in the evening. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a bit mm -hmm. of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, like, but for the top of the hill, uh, I'm certainly hoping with the, the folks who are being honored uh, mm -hmm. that there would be a good representation. I have There's a matinee them. for the high school musical on Sunday. Yes, there is. We did okay. share that information yeah. with them. I, I so appreciate how you, you are strengthening the um, collaboration, the, the bond between the seniors and the schools. I think that's really important and yeah. deep felt. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Both. They are paying for our kids' education. It, they are. Mm -hmm. They are, they are sponsoring it. Yeah. So we are only, you know, just reciprocating in a small way, showing our gratitude. All right. Um, so, oh, and one other. I guess related to the turf field hasn't happened yet, but we have our next meeting with CPC actually also on Tuesday, the night of top of the hill. So I've asked them to put <coughs> us last on their agenda so that we can be there for the beginning because it really is going to be a very, very special night. So hopefully all of us can be there. Um, so moving along to school committee chair report, I don't have much to report other than that Nancy and um, Susan and Kathy and I met with local daycare centers um, who came in to talk to us about the discussion that we've been having around our bus um, transportation. transportation policy. Thank you. Um, it was a really, I thought, very helpful meeting. There were several good um, suggestions that got put on the table. Kathy and Susan are doing a lot more thinking and um, about some of the suggestions and what might be feasible and what might add some value. So rather than go into a lot of detail, uh, we all agreed that we would put that back on our agenda for our next meeting, and we'll send out a listserv in advance. So um, I think that probably covers as much as we need to say about it right now. Um, so we have that to look forward to. But other than that, I have received no other communications to the school committee. Um, so warrants, I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrant. 18-24, 18-25, and 18-27. All warrants have been included in your packet. I have also approved for payment the payroll warrants S18010, S1810A, and S1810V. All warrants have been included in your packet. <coughs> um, my next update is about the superintendent search, which um, I have to say we have a very strong pool of candidates, and we have a very strong 
um, I think, screening committee. Uh, Jen and I have been really pleased with um, the level of engagement and participation. Susan's on that as well. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I, I think that it's, um, we're in very good position to, to find a successful, a successful successor to Dr. McLeod. Um, so all of that gets us down to our monthly financial report from Ms. Rothermick. Thank you. Um, what you have, um, basically what I'll do is just go over the cover memo um, and then you can ask questions if there's anything within the, the details. Um, this is basically a similar report to what you've seen in the past um, to, to date, but including with it is the, the Munis financial report, which will go forward doing that on a more recurring basis. Um, but basically it's the... <coughs> The Excel report, if you will, is organized by salary and expense, really coming just right out of the Munis report. And at this time, it includes a positive variance of 26,753 in payroll and 110,573 in expense. So at this point in time, we have a total positive variance of 137 in terms of projecting out to the end of the year. Um, so the details of the variances are outlined within the packet and the net position for the grants, the revolvings, and the capital accounts are there included as well. The follow-on to, to that also, um, which comes up later, are the, the budget transfers, which really is just chewing up where we are, all those um, salary accounts, which will account for, um, you know, movements within staff, hiring, uh, attrition, um, lane changes and everything, and it will chew those balances up to where our actual stand at this point. Very good. Any questions? Okay. Dr. McLeod, we are ready for your superintendent report. Oh, um, so in the interest of time and given everything else that we have covered tonight, I feel like everything I would have had to report has been reported. Okay. So thank you very much. Just gain back a minute. Ten minutes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, so now we can approve the aforementioned budget transfers, correct? Correct. Okay, so unless anybody has any further questions, I'm looking for a motion to approve the budget transfers as outlined in the agenda materials. So moved. Okay. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Kavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, and so anyone opposed or abstained? So that's unanimous. Um, and now we are on the field trip recruit request. Yep. Um, so I will be seeking um, separate approval for, for each of three field trips, but I'd like to talk about them together, if I may. Mm -hmm. High School Robotics World Championships, Kentucky, the Middle School Robotics World Championships to Kentucky, and the Business Professionals of America in Texas. And the reason I want to talk about them together is because um, Doug Scott, who not only has brought so many wonderful op opportunities to our students, and his enthusiasm, as you know from having him here, is just infectious. Um, he's been very responsive to um, the requests of the school committee um, and, and myself to um, some feedback that we gave him last year on field trips, specifically uh, requiring some changes as a result to some of our overnight uh, intent to travel forms. So these are intense, um, and I want to stress that because we'll have to see how the students do. But the two things that we asked them to do was to really provide some um, uh, um, evidence that he has the support of other teachers, mm -hmm. so that when students are going to be missing class, that the other student, that the other teachers have also supported this request and are not taken by surprise. And he has done that um, in terms of, in, in my opinion, the classroom teacher support um, indicates that they understand that school will be missed and they support and understand that um, in, in showing their support that the um, benefit is going to outweigh the time that the kids are going to be missing school and the teachers based on um, past last year, I think partly, um, do not have concerns about kids being able to make up the time. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was one of the, th the most important thing for all of us mm -hmm. um, because it was significant. It was a, quite a change that, um, that trips were being requested that included two, three days of missed school time. Um, I feel satisfied that he's done that, um, and um, as a result, the 
these are initials. The, we will get much more detail in terms of, you know, the the travel, you know, the details of the travel and how they're getting there, etc. Um, what's been provided in the packet is what they would be doing, and I believe this first one would be a result of yeah, it's the World Championship, so they would have to first be able to um, get there based on their competition. Yeah. Um, so with that said, um, the first trip, the high school, uh, the Robotics World Championship to Kentucky would take place Thursday, April 25th of 2018, um, returning on Sunday, April the 28th. Looks like they would be missing two days of school. And I don't know if you want to take them, the motions individually, um, Jean, or if you want me to go through all three of these. Do you guys want to vote on them separately? Are there any that anybody wants to pull out? Because if okay. not, in the interest Excited of... I'm excited about this. I want to go. Yeah, <laughs> I know. In the I interest know. of time, let's put just well, okay. together. They can use, they can use uh, supervision, Chaplain. so yep. just, you Is know. Is that right? Absolutely, <laughs> Mina. Um, so then the Middle School Robotics World Championship, same, same time period, although it looks like, oh, it's a little bit longer, till May the 1st, 2018. Uh, I think that is allow, at least last year, it was a, a, to allow for parents to drive the kids. Mm -hmm. Is that? Well, it looks like it's yeah, the high school first, and then the middle school immediately follows it. Oh, you're right. Oh. That's it. It's the 28th. Thank you. Correct. Sleep. And then business professionals um, to Texas, May the 9th through the 13th, 2018. I recommend approval of the intent to travel on all three of these um, programs. Okay. Um, so we'll just change that in the motion intent to travel. Yes. Um, okay. Any questions or discussion? No, I, so I just agree with Dr. McLeod. What Dr. McLeod said there was an ask by the yep. school committee, and and I think not only does this show the support, but it also yep. says to us, I think that there's a commitment on Mr. Scott's part to make sure that. The, the students are aligned with their teachers leading up to this, right. understand what they're going to miss and what, you know, what needs to be made up and all those kinds of things. And I think that's as important as even just the initial support. So, yeah, no, I agree. As, as he does with his daily job, he uh, really went above and beyond in, in meeting our request he to sure did. demonstrate that other teachers were supportive. I mean, down to the guidance counselors and everything. So that was very much appreciated. Um, okay, so then I'm just looking for a motion to approve the intents to travel as indicated in the agenda materials. About that? Good, so moved. Okay, a motion by Ms. Cavanaugh and a second. Second. By Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? So that is unanimous. And the kids better start practicing. Practicing. <laughs> Okay, so now I believe that we are we have arrived at our second opportunity for public comment. So we're going to be able to skip right over that because nobody's here. And now we are on items by consensus. So, Dr. McLeod. The superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. Are there any that anyone wants to pull out? I have one question. I thought that in one of the revised ones, I saw the minutes of October 17th also included with the, am I looking at the wrong, uh, do you all see the October 17th? October, October 17th. Yes, the one before November the 2nd. I have October 19th. Yes. Do 19th. you see that? October I have October 19th, 19th in my packet. And not October? November 2nd? And I have November 2nd. Okay, so that's included. Okay. So yeah. October 19th was not included in the items by consensus motion, Mina? Is that what you're saying? Uh, uh, okay, so we'll yeah. add that. That would be Good J. So that was October 19th. Yeah. Good I. Okay. Anything else? So I just need a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. Um, okay, a motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, a second by Ms. Barrett. All in favor? Yes. 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 Anyone opposed or abstained? So that is ex that is unanimous, and we are all set with that. And so um, we are now going to, I will now look for a motion to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation. We will return to public session solely for the purposes of adjournment. And um, our next meetings will be our next meeting will be November 30th. So we wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, um, particularly to our faithful HCAM 
uh, videographer over there who is very patient with us. So thank you all. This ends the public portion of our meeting. And um, I will ask for a motion to enter into executive session. Second. And a second. Okay. Um, motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Kavanaugh. Jen? Yes. Tina? Yes. John? Yep. Nancy? Yes. And I'm a yes, so we are um, uh, yes. And what time is it? At 11 p.m. 11. Oh, 11 p.m. Wow.